Okay, and so uh, we're back. Um, technical difficulties, as usual, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <coughs> um, and so, um, let me just check. Um, did you, you went to the YouTube page? Yeah, the one that you threw up. Okay. Um, oh, now it is. Okay, we're good. Super fantastic. We're rocking. Now, let's go to the... Which one is, it's this one, right? Yeah. Okay, and then who said presentation mode? Is that a thing, is that a button I can? I don't see the usual button that I view. hit view. I don't know. full screen, slideshow. Slideshow. <gasps> Dude, what's your name? Okay. He gets the prize. Yeah, sir. Thanks. Right. Okay. So uh, we're back, and I was in the middle of saying how the record schedule paradigm doesn't work in various ways, and and really, uh, we know that it doesn't work for print to paper. First of all, digital objects now come in a variety of uh, hypermedia that can't. So anything that's based on printed paper is, is old school and 20th century. But we've also found in the last couple decades that dragging and dropping objects is beyond the compliance level of virtually everyone. Now, there are groups of records managers and archivists in the world who do everything right. And there are communities, there are cultures and communities that do a good job of uh, complying with what is written in statutes and regulations and policies about record keeping. I'm not um, uh, giving the broadest brush here, but um, for most of us, we uh, do not comply with record keeping policies and rules unless the technology embeds the rules so that it makes it easy because none of us have time in this world. We are all overwhelmed by uh, the amount of emails, by text, uh, by social media of all kinds, and the expectation that somehow people in the U.S. government or people in a corporation are going to be dragging and dropping objects to some record-keeping scheme is a fantasy. It worked when there were very few uh, records, but there are just too many um, for us to deal with, and so the whole par the paradigm does not work. Uh, okay, Failed record-keeping paradigms, well, this is kind of sub-paradigm, print to paper, uh, backup tapes, which we know can be used for disaster recovery, they are extremely difficult, um, cost a tremendous amount of money to restore records from data streamed to uh, a set of tapes. Things have gotten better with indexing over the last 10 years, but it's still a horrendous proposition. You don't, and actually the, the National Archives says you shall not use backup tapes for record keeping purposes. Then it's all of our idiosyncratic practices that we put our PSD files somewhere, we, we, uh, we all give names to different folders. That's not record keeping the way that uh, makes it easy for the organization to know what it knows and makes it very difficult to access records within organizations. There's something called a 505.2 standard. I've lectured on that before and I'm not gonna get into it. It's just, it's a set of functional specifications that were developed in the 1990s for electronic keeping software. They are very good in terms of their granularity uh, functional requirements. They're not used very much. It's not failed, but they're underutilized because their Achilles heel is that it requires individuals to drag and drop objects into the various categories that are set up in these schemas that are otherwise compliant in a whole sorts of ways. And so that's the problem. Now, John Mancini, who was president of AIM till recently, um, and myself, we're singing the same tune. If you mean records management the way that it has been practiced um, in organizations uh, of the last 150 years, it's basically dead because no one complies with the rules. Um, that's a harsh statement, but as I say, there are exceptions, but basically it's virtually um, uh, across all organizations that there's a lack of compliance with the rules. There's just an accumulation of records and data, um, especially in the cloud. Uh, it's easy to store stuff, not so easy to get it back, not so easy to access it, not so easy to categorize it. But uh, the idea that we get busy people to figure out complicated schemes is ridiculous. 
uh, now in the present world and decade of the 21st century and going further. So that was recognized by some of us and we recognize there's a transactional toll. There's a, it's basically a toll on, on our time to do something with respect to records. And so we avoid it. Uh, we just let stuff accumulate. And so we're looking, we're all looking for an easy pass uh, rather than the traditional tolls. Um, there was a proclamation in the prior administration uh, by President Obama that said, um, proper records management is the backbone of open government. Um, we live in a glass house in the federal government because there are lots of access statutes that are involved. Uh, President Obama issued a memorandum in 2011 uh, that said that he recognizes the problem of record keeping and that we need technology to solve um, basic record keeping issues. And so he, he threw down a gauntlet uh, to the archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, um, who is still there, and um, uh, as of the time that I'm speaking here, and uh, Jeffrey Zients uh, at OMB. It, OMB and NARA were to solve this problem. They went around the government, and they asked for a recommendation, but basically uh, some of us uh, came up with some bullet points, and two of them that are very important. It was just like John F. Kennedy saying, we'll go to the moon by the end of the decade, by December 31, 2019, which seemed a long way off when we said it in 2012, um, that uh, federal agencies will manage all of their permanent records in an electronic format. That means actually a binary issue. They need to separate what's permanent and what's temporary. So it's, uh, it embeds that assumption that it can be done. And then uh, by December 31, 2016, again, this was out of 2012, federal agencies will manage their email, all of their email in an in electronic format and not print to paper anymore. That was the directive. That directive stands uh, and is continuing through uh, today. Uh, so email is the 800 pound gorilla here of information governance, of scandals, of controversy. You can't go uh, a week maybe a day without email being cited by the media, you know, whether it's CNN or it's uh, traditional newspapers or other social media sites. Um, and increasingly there are other forms of communications, texts and otherwise that are also um, citable, but it is still the, uh, the go-to medium for lawyers, at least to find in evidence um, what is actually being said by individuals. And, and you can think of all kinds of scandals that, that have involved email. So um, uh, some of us were involved in pushing a new approach, really a new paradigm um, uh, at the National Archives to manage email and uh, potentially applicable to all electronic records, but start with email, which is basically to categorize uh, email in a binary way. The binary rule would be there's a bunch of email that is permanently valuable and you should keep that. And that email is going to be mostly from a select group of senior officials who get policy papers via email and attachments and who are part of decision making in the organization. And we will treat all of that blob of senior official email as permanent and everything else at the agency, the thousands of employees that are part of a federal agency of any given size, could be tens of thousands, treat as um, something else, some, uh, not a capstone account, but a non-capstone account, and just to be preserved for, let's say, seven years under a schedule, if they're substantive records. So that is that is a capstone. Um, if you think of it, you think of it as a pyramid with a capstone on, on the top with a small group of senior officials. If it's the uh, National Archives, we're talking you know less than 100, somewhere between 50 and 100 officials would be capstone accounts. Everyone else in a 3,000 person agency um, would be non-capstone accounts. And so that is a bifurcation by role, not by substantive category. This is where the very difficulty arises trying to convince the record keeping world and the archivist world that, that email is different, that it is so pervasive, ubiquitous, and uh, covers such a wide kaleidoscope of records groups and categories by substance that it's better to treat it as a blob um, and to categorize it as what is permanent and what is temporary 
by role. Now we can do a better AI job in the future in terms of granularity, but that's a first step for the government. And I can say that um, it seems to be working in the short term. Uh, so the example of Capstone, I've already said NARA here, uh, it's just, I, I don't want anyone listening to me to say we're saving everything. We are saving email and attachments for seven years as a default for everybody, but then it's disposed of, except if there's a legal hold, there's some lawyers that are imposing some legal obligation. So only a small, everything is saved in the short term and a small sliver of email is saved for the permanent long term. Fortunately, or fortunately, uh, if you're a historian, that small sliver uh, multiplied by 300 federal agencies is a huge volume, which actually will come to billions of records by itself. Certainly not just the White House, but the rest of government. Um, it seems to be working. Um, uh, this is a slide that I have that when using Capstone, there's a number of traditional record keeping considerations that one needs to do. I'm gonna go past this slide. Um, uh, there are record schedules now. There's a general record schedule applied to Capstone accounts, and there there is a need in some instances to to still preserve the email in some other place other than the large repository of a Capstone repository. And there's a need to have metadata. But the basic point is that you're preserving these objects in two different types: one permanent, one temporary. And from the uh, recent narrow reports, this one and later ones. It seems that more than 100 federal agencies have adopted Capstone. And this means that potentially uh, citizens could FOIA those agencies and expect that um, there would be searches of what will be growing archives of email and attachments in one place, whether it's in the cloud or siloed, um, you know, in an IT shop somewhere. Uh, it would be searchable and um, it will be accessible. Now, subject to, of course, the exemptions of the FOIA or other restricted categories, and we're gonna get to that uh, later. Now, so uh, in just a moment, the coming age of dark archives, this paradox of the inability to provide access unless we have smart ways of extracting signal from noise is due to privacy considerations primarily. It's due to volume and it's due to privacy. and. I am all about providing citizen access to dark archives. I don't want the archives of the future of, of the year 2050 to be at the National Archives that you can't walk in and see anything because it's all digital and it's all not been opened yet. Uh, in fact, there's a 75 year default under current policy at NARA, which is that if records are of a personal nature or they contain some personal uh, piece of information, they're reflexively or default uh, uh, not opened for 75 years until the last person dies in that. Um, so uh, we don't have privacy interests after that period. But the question is, is, is that too long for us to open the records of uh, recent administrations? Can't we do a better job? And so that's what we need technology for. We have to filter sensitive content. We have to be, um, at least cognizant, there are privacy issues and there are other types of categories of information. This is a non-exhaustive list. There are personally identifiable information in the form of um, uh, numbers, uh, strings of numbers like social security numbers that are in a well-formed expression, but, and driver's licenses. We can account for much of that, although there is a fuzziness to errors that are made in in records, and so it, it goes off from the usual expression. But then we have categories of material that are a little bit harder to pull out or extract so as to make a record collection uh, less sensitive, to anonymize it um, because of arrest records and because of intellectual property concerns and nine categories of FOIA, including deliberate process. There are, and legal privileges, there are significant uh, issues to simply extracting out sensitive content, but we can do a better job. And the types of sensitive content, um, there are the regular expressions I talked about, there's textual content, which is difficult enough in any kind of relevance query to isolate text that is on a subject. Um, and then there's non-textual content. It is a world of 
of data out there that is just not textual. And so we're going to need new methods for that. Um, the directives mean that everything will be preserved uh, in email for a short period of time. The adoption of capstone policies means that there's a repository that can be easily made subject to a search. But of course, how to search a billion objects is not a trivial task. Um, and um, we can have a more complete historical record of the government. That's what we're talking about, the history of the 21st century, if we can overcome barriers to access. Well, let's pause for a moment and talk about search. So uh, the search haystack, is, the haystacks are large. The task is to find responsive records or to filter out categories of records. When I, as a lawyer, want to um, search for relevant records in a lawsuit, I need to find all the relevant needles to do a comprehensive job. I can't just stop on the first three pages of a Google search for a restaurant and call it a day. I need to find all the relevant records. So that's a problem in a world of huge volumes. Um, I need to find just the wheat and not any of the chaff. I need perfect recall and perfect precision. I've lectured about that in my last lecture here at MIT. There's a, a flawed approach which we seized upon about a decade ago in, in the law that keywords don't work. They're both under-inclusive and over-inclusive because of the ambiguities of language. Um, and um, I was involved a decade ago or so with a search of Clinton White House 20 million emails. We eventually, through keywords, got down to 200,000 documents, 100,000 were relevant, 100,000 weren't. It took six months, it took a lot of people. Um, I realized at the time that is not the way that the legal profession should proceed. There's got to be a better way for lawyers to search ESI. And a because of the track legal track and because of advances in technology, there's a whole class of machine learning that has now been applied in the legal space. Um, supervised machine learning is the absolute flavor of the moment um, where we can uh, task an algorithm with learning about what is relevant what is for a particular category of documents that are relevant to a lawsuit, relevant to a set of uh, requests to produce. Uh, based on training data, we can uh, train the algorithm with people in a quality control process. And um, we can do this um, you know, based on examples of showing documents. So we're no longer in a keyword world. Lots of lawyers are still relying on keywords to some extent, but um, those of the sort of the most advanced thinking in the space, uh, certainly in my law firm, um, uh, we use advanced search methods to search, to get visibility into very large data sets. It's called predictive coding, and it's basically coding software with um, subject matter experts looking at a, a, a document set, a training set, or um, as you go through the collection in kind of a uh, continuous active learning function, you fine tune the algorithm by looking at examples that it's pitching out and saying whether they're relevant or not relevant. And so this is a, a well-known um, uh, set of techniques, set of algorithms that are in use that combine both human in the loop and uh, combine various sorts of algorithms that cluster documents that are uh, a lot alike. Um, this kind of algorithm was given a judicial thumbs up by Judge Peck in 2012. And so sort of a new chapter in the law occurred where um, he was telling people, at least in the Southern District of New York in Manhattan, that in his court, we don't have to be guinea pigs. We can uh, uh, find that uh, we can do discovery by using these kind of algorithms rather than keywords or manual searches and that it's appropriate. And his opinion has been followed in dozens of cases. And it's, you know, with each passing year, there will be more and more case law about technology-assisted review. But here's the thing. I started with the fact that, you know, can we make, can we reduce dimensionality? The, the issue in the records world, um, we'd like to think that the problems are one zero, but uh, re reality kicks in. Organizations of all types want um, at least more categories than just two, permanent and temporary. It works for email, for capstone, doesn't work in all environments. 
And so it would be nice to have automated categorization of records into a variety of categories. The problem in information retrieval, uh, the difference between the e-discovery context and a records context is essentially that the binary classifications for relevance, what's relevant and not, what's privileged and not, those are more easily addressed by a, a set of different types of algorithms um, than dealing with a legacy environment of 500 record series and having 25 record retention periods. You know, uh, for this series, it'd be 10 years, for this series, it'd be 20 years. Um, so the records management task, in part today, has been uh, an acknowledgement of collapsing record series into bigger buckets. And the focus on records retention as a driver for um, records retention periods as a driver for big buckets, not the series itself. So you could have multiple series of records that are all part of one retention period. This, 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 and this are all going to be kept for X number of years in a bigger bucket. Um, and that helps the algorithms because if they just figure out that records can be in that bigger bucket and not have to do a more granular approach, they're more successful. So bigger buckets than what has uh, been before. That is part of the new paradigm. There are also concepts called coverage and detail that I, I, I won't go into here except to note different ways to evaluate auto categorization in terms of uh, comprehensiveness of the record series, the records that you have part of a record series or the detail in terms of the metadata in the records. Um, Techniques like these can be used to classify content into a variety of different ways. Um, and we could spend the rest of the afternoon here talking about different types of technologies. I've pointed out a few that are in the upcoming slides. Uh, the real question is, again, separating out wheat and chaff, the ultimate goal here is, uh, for the US government, is permanent and temporary across all records, not just email but it would be nice to be more granular as well. And so there's a series of um, approaches that we can uh, discuss in this space. I'm just going to march through it very fast here. Uh, slides are from my colleague, Nathaniel Payne at UBC. Um, and a couple of source uh, materials here that are well worth looking at. Um, at MIT, I am sure that uh, many students have encountered supervised learning in a variety of contexts. Uh, and so I don't need to say too much here about that. There are other flavors of machine learning and other types of automation that need to be considered in the record keeping space as part of um, the mix. And so you have rule-based classification rules um, where they are easy to implement, but um, there's a disadvantage in terms of at higher dimensions, higher numbers of categories, there are challenges involved. And significant time can be spent updating the decision rule methods. Um, there's a fuzzy correlation kind of set of techniques that apply across the board to everything else I'm talking about um, that uh, we need to get away from trying to match single words um, into something that is uh, that takes into account an error function in terms of uh, words being spelt right uh, and being recognized as part of a examples in a document. There are vector space methods um, that, uh, that are used in e-discovery and are very good. Support vector machines are very good if you're in a binary classification world, but they're not so good if they have to be used for um, dealing with multiple categories of records. So the e-discovery world, we're all about support vector machines in part, but uh, in terms of advanced techniques to find uh, what is relevant to a problem. Not so, not so uh, easy to do in a record keeping space. And part of this lecture is to encourage the crowd listening to see if they can do a better job of parsing out. And then there are other types of uh, information retrieval methods that I don't pretend to have used. There are nearest neighbor methods. Again, there's uh, advantages to those compared with other methods that are being discussed here, and there are disadvantages. And so um, what we need is bright people to uh, do essentially a, an experiment across different types of algorithms to see how categorization of records, whether it's in the federal record space or just 
records generally can be done using these different methods. They're tree-based methods. Um, and I don't think I have much more here. There's one more, which is neural networks. And here, we're seeing this in the driverless car experience that there's a whole set of different sources of data that are being used by uh, what is a, a neural network uh, to, um, to deal with problems of driving. We could apply this very fancy technology to dealing with documents that have a high dimensionality of features, uh, but there are disadvantages to this and there's a high computing cost and it's, uh, it's challenging to understand. And so with that, um, what I set out here is steps for designing an auto classification system. We need to certainly under, whatever method is used, we need to understand training requirements. We need to understanding how the input features work and will be represented. We need to understand the structure of the functions and, and learning algorithms. Um, and we need to have kind of a, a testing protocol uh, across uh, the set. So uh, with that, um, how mature is auto categorization technology? Well, my homage to Carla Dez here is that uh, we, I'm sure everyone uh, watching this, listening, uh, knows who Carla Dez is. Um, he's the father of taxonomy to the animal kingdom. And with respect to auto classification in the e-discovery world and the record keeping world, the categorization optimization issue sort of produces this. So we have categories that are merged together and mushed together and um, there isn't a 100% accuracy in categorization using any of these methods. In fact, they're just problems. There are problems with text classification and beyond uh, where uh, methods say that, you know, two objects uh, look alike because of some features, but they clearly are not alike. But we have a, a ways to go. But the future is with AI. The future is not capstone. The future is ha applying these techniques to categorize information in more granular ways. And, to, and whoever invents the better mousetrap in terms of one of these techniques, whether it's vector space or neural networks, um, applied to record keeping, really, uh, now that is an IPO that I'd like to sign up for. So uh, in terms of my interest in ensuring a complete record of government activities, I have three propositions here. I want to make sure that a comprehensive record is, exists. That means capturing and filtering technologies like Capstone, that there'll be a complete historical record of government. I want to encourage auto categorization using fancy techniques to um, parse out portions of, of the, the universe, so into certain types of record series, and to advance uh, search and review uh, possibilities. And we should be in, we should be talking government about advanced search, about technology assisted review to provide access not just to e-discovery, but also under FOIA and otherwise. So there's a research agenda to this talk. And hopefully those who are part of the computational law course, um, it's uh, will recognize there's a signal to noise issue here that we need to mm, do a better job of finding permanent records and not just relying on roles but roles is a first approximation. Um, do a better job in terms of auto categorization strategies for distinguishing record series. And we need to evaluate how, after using this techniques, um, we are doing with respect to the total capture of email. Capstone and the 2019 policy are going to result in billions and billions, I feel like Carl said, uh, records um, coming into both repositories and agencies and at the archives. And we really need to think through uh, the right of citizen access to those records. My future, well, I have faith in analytics. I have faith in algorithms doing a better job of information governance generally and separating out weed and chaff, both in the private sector and the public sector. And now I also have some degree of faith that blockchains can be used for record keeping. The Ethereum, flavor of distributed ledger technology seems to be a pointer to the future where we can not only have blockchains um, pointing to data on documents and in an encrypted way and locking down in terms of trustworthiness of records, but also have the records themselves um, through either Ethereum or some other uh, blockchain-like or DLT-like technology to be 
uh, preserved in amber. And I, I think of blockchains as like bugs preserved in amber. And, and the trustworthiness elements that blockchain brings to the equation um, are certainly uh, central to uh, the buzz around blockchains at the moment and why MIT and other places are the seriously working um, to advance the cause. And so um, I think that the future of record keeping is going to involve blockchain in part, involve all sorts of analytics as I'm talking about. So lastly, what I'd say is uh, older people like myself, well, we're going. Um, and off to our islands to write our books about uh, our days um, in government or otherwise. Uh, there is a green field here uh, for millennials to take up my call to arms, to use technologies uh, and analytics and blockchains and whatever comes down the pike to have more sophisticated strategies to open archives up. We can do this by innovative means. We can talk to each other across disciplines. Um, and I hope that, that uh, my showing up at MIT is part of that as a lawyer talking about these things. I think culture change is possible, both in government as well as in the private sector. I've edited a book. I get no royalties for this, but I strongly encourage people to take a look at a book on uh, all the kind of um, uh, algorithm methods that are being used in e-discovery and to some extent information governance. Um, there's a set of references here for further reading, and I'm also happy to talk to anyone who's been part of this conversation today about the future of record keeping um, from a lawyer's perspective. If you're excited by this topic, well, let's talk, uh, because uh, there's only a bright future for you uh, in terms of how uh, we're going to do record keeping in the future using algorithms and um, using AI techniques. So I really appreciate, Daza, the opportunity to uh, talk at MIT today, and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Jason. That was based on um, what I'm seeing online. Extremely awesome. <laughs> um, and let me ask what, what we're transitioning. Um, are there any um, comments or questions on it on on that? Naturally. In fact, they already are. Um, let's go like this. Um, and you can see in kind of two installments, I suppose, uh, the uh, a video and the talk over Jason's uh, remarks. Any other uh, questions, comments, ideas? Well, I guess you nailed it. Um, I have one, which is, um, let's just say, if hypothetically people wanted to take you up on your, you threw the gauntlet down there a little bit in a, in a <laughs> gentle way, but um, but I heard it um, on people. Uh, look, look, let me see if there's folks that want to try their hand at using some of the um, more cutting edge um, AI and um, the, the sort of like adaptive algorithmic techniques. Um, is, if people wanted to, you know, poke at that and um, try to do something, what would be your advice for how would they get started? What would they do? My advice is for you, Dasa, to um, yes. to open source uh, some of this stuff uh, so that uh, MIT students can participate. Uh, it is uh, unfortunately a world of proprietary software that we're talking about for the most part, and so we need to convince okay. um, the vendor community to open up and to have um, some kind of demonstrations where people can participate. And I think it's a good um, gauntlet back to me as to whether there we can have that kind of dialogue in the future. Right, and obviously proprietary. So the relates specifically to um, not the really the license type of, you know, there's so many business models out there, but the notion of being able to have an open competitive market where we can um, benchmark one another, we can look at performance or we can look at objective measures um, and uh, thereby maybe have some basis to evaluate and assess are we making progress and what are um, good approaches. This is also a scientific question to some extent as you know information science and, uh, and well, you know, I was platforms go. I was involved in, uh, in starting something called the Trek Legal Track. So I, I went to NIST and we, we as lawyers came to the party on text retrieval 
So there are uh, tracks that are relevant, okay. and it may well be that uh, that's one avenue for MIT students and others to play in, which is to check out Trek and, and possibly build a better engine for uh, searching as part of that experience. Okay, so you heard, I know there's some MIT students in the room, I'm looking at you all, um, and there's many more that are watching and who will uh, hear this later in spring semester, so um, the gauntlet has been thrown down. It must be answered. Okay, <laughs> thanks. 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 Much obliged. Um, Jason. Okay. Um, so we're going to, I need to text Shauna to let her know to click the link now. One of um, one of our cohort. Does anyone have Shauna's? Never mind. Let me do it. Um, message, I think the three letters N O W are it. All right, so, all right, so where are the absolute most current slides? They were emailed to me when and by whom? Uh, Shona sent them this morning, I think. Okay, so. I'm just going to do it like this. Yeah. Okay. I, Everybody um, commit to memory proprietary client information in my email. Thanks. <laughs> or actually, don't do that. Okay, so Shauna. I didn't have to get them right this second. So, do you want, wow. I, do you want me to forward them? I don't. Oh, here we go. They must have been. Is this it? Does it look familiar? Yeah. 17 hours. Yep. Okay. All right. Close enough. <laughs> so, I should know how to do this. I'll hit them like this, and then I'll go 19 slides. Yeah. Say, open with Google Slides, the way that we do. Um. All right. So this might be a good opportunity, actually, while we're while we're um going through this to get everybody on the same channel, um, literally. Um. So, uh, do you do you mind telling people um. Mr. Poppers, um, tell everybody how to get on Telegram and get so into the right what, channel. What we're going to do, go to law.mic.edu slash learning. Okay. And uh, there's going to be the slide deck, the one of the slide deck that we have the intro with the phone lines. Oh, okay. I need to put the slides in. So. Okay. Yep. So, that's right. There is this scroll almost all the way down the page. There is a slide back there, and you're just going to go to, let's see, uh, oh, change. Let's see, uh, let's see old, what happened to the. Okay. Um, I sent the link out of an email. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's the deck is on there with the um. Is is the link just? It, it's it's in the um. Here, I'll pull it up on the. Uh, I'll, the I'll pull it up. Yeah. Okay. But it. I should have. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was, yeah. It was on. It was on the deck. So it's for those of you online. Yeah. Now hear this. Um, this is how you can participate like a first class citizen. Present to everybody. Yes, okay. so we have the, uh, Here we go. So we're on the class. Um, this is the class working page. Scroll down, 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 and where did you? Oh, I'm there sorry. Don't do that. Actually, what we need to do is click View Me on GitHub. So we're really going to get hacky here by some standards, and then select the wiki. This is how one way to get to the wiki for the class. And what are we looking for? Miscellaneous tools, tools and resources. Miscellaneous tools and res yep. resources. Telegram. And Telegram group chat. So okay. four steps there. Five. Um, let me say. Uh, so go to, yeah. And then, yeah, also if you go to the uh, MIT Media Lab .github.io slash 2018, whatever that link is, if you scroll down, that's what I was trying to look for, which is the, the slide deck, and it actually just has links you can click on. So you oh, that right. instead of the Yep. So if we go back yeah. a little bit um, to the um, to the class, here we are. Um, 
where do we find those links? Scroll, scroll there. Yeah, and then the uh, slide six. Okay, on the slide. Yes. Okay, so go one, two, three, four, five, six. Aha. There it is. Oh, that's sweet. Okay, yeah. so Telegram. Um, use your phone number to register your new account. That's how they kind of link your account to a phone. Um, if you're able to, if you have phones, we know that some people don't have computers for security reasons. Uh, but this, and then you create a username, and then you can click this um, link to join a channel. So anybody who can do that should do that. And um, we're not. We're, this is an experiment for me anyway. Not using Slack and not using um, other chat channels, but using the same kind of system that people are talking about these topics and uh, technically. And um, I think it seems to have some advantages. You can export all the data later, which we like, so we can kind of put it on our page and we can kind of like have the dialogue. And it, the main thing is we're looking for a way to allow people who are participating online, who maybe in Washington or other places to have closer to the rich experience that we're having in the room using nothing but basically free tools um, and just by composing them in the right way. All right, so thanks again for yes. helping us put that together. And anyone who's installing this right now in the room, um, do yourself a favor and turn off the notifications. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good call. Okay. Are we using the YouTube live stream, too? Yes, there's a YouTube live stream. Do you want to know how that's? No, I just wanted to make sure that we were switching on. We, we are. Um, and so we're broadcasting right now. And um, Okay. Um, let's see. And it looks like Sean is not on yet. So let me invite her again. Here we go, Sean Hoffman. Okay. Copy, invite. Um, all right. Sure, why Shauna? Is anybody in touch with Shauna to know? I've emailed her the uh, she did uh, link to uh, she she blogged about the session just now, so it's out there right now. Okay, all right. Well, maybe should we just get started with uh, the people who we have? So. I guess you can share this. Like, should we, should we well, let's see should we put it in the middle? Yeah. I think if you put it on the um, side and leave it to the side. Uh, sure. But we'll want to use the mic. We're kind of doing this a little bit ghetto. Um, yeah, so. It looks like it might fall off. Good call. That's why you're the TA. Can I? No, definitely. You might want to just, um, depending on who's talking, get right up in there. Okay, so, um, right. let's, um, let me see what we're, excuse me. What we're, uh, you want to um, start by introducing yourselves, perhaps? And, I'm going to, and I'll switch uh, to screen share as soon as you've done that. Excuse me. There we go. In Google Hangout, that's how we do it. Ta da! So we're right down the, right down the alley. Maybe we should sit closer. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. And the mic is pretty sensitive there. Actually, that's surprisingly good given, <laughs> given how we're doing this. Laura? Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Oh, there she is. <laughs> this was a little more challenging than I had realized it was going to be to try to get in. So you guys look beautiful today. Hello. <laughs> I'm to see you. All right. Hello. 
Great. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll help get us started. Um, so, hey everybody. <laughs> so this is um, the second segment of uh, the first day of the computational law course, and I'm very happy and well, um, I don't know, maybe just slightly proud uh, to uh, welcome back uh, the star panel from the Women in Blockchain. Uh, panelists from the Women in Blockchain panel at our first MIT Legal Forum on October 30th and 31st, which was just a smash hit. And, um, and it seemed to be, uh, it got a lot of buzz and there's a lot of excitement about it. And since then there's been more meetings and you know it's grown well and it's uh, prospering and now has a new brand, um, the Blockchain Diversity Group. And, um, and the original panelists are were willing to uh, share some more deep, deep information, more of a curricular form um, that I'm very excited by. I've been watching the iterations of the content and this is exactly the kind of content that we had in mind to set the tone and to create a landscape um, a framework, um, especially in the blockchain space. And so without further ado, I'd love to hand it uh, back to the Blockchain Diversity Group um, to walk us through your presentation. And, um, and then we have time for a discussion at the end of that. So um, please introduce yourselves and take it away. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for attending today. And I am moderating. My name is Shauna Hoffman, and I am, of course, part of the Diversity and Blockchain group um, with the ladies that you see here today. And I work at IBM as the Cognitive Legal Co-Leader. And I'd love to give an opportunity for um, each of our guest speakers to talk a little bit about themselves. Michelle, would you like to start? Sure. Thanks, Shauna. I'm Michelle Gitlitz. I'm a partner at Blank Room LLP. I'm a securities lawyer, and I'm also the co-chair of our blockchain working group. And I do a lot of work uh, helping companies uh, with emerging technologies, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and the like. Hi, I'm Susan Joseph. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Susan Joseph. I have my own uh, consulting company, largely targeted at blockchain and insurance, although I also help out at the UN uh, pro bono. I am also a lawyer, though practicing more on the business side of things, and um, got involved in this about three years ago and have an identity expertise as well. And I'm Laura Jill. I'm a partner at Baker Hostetler uh, in Washington, D.C. I spent most of my career uh, before going back into private practice working in technology as an in-house lawyer and a senior executive on um, an internet company, a big internet company, right around the time uh, emerging law, the internet was making emerging law. So I come to this from a perspective of lessons learned and mistakes made. Last time around, um, we had a sort of transformative uh, technology and hopefully that will do a little better this next time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we have a great agenda for you today. We have about two hours with you, maybe a little bit less. And um, do we have the presentation up so everyone can see it? Absolutely. Okay, so a little bit of my challenge is going to be seeing the presentation alongside um, you all. Is there a way for me to do that? Ah, there we go. Excellent. So let's go ahead and uh, head to the next page. We'll talk a little bit about the agenda today. And the okay. different items we'll be covering. Oh, it looks like the end of the presentation. Oh, is that the? Yeah. So, by the way, a part of the agenda is a Q&A time. <laughs> so we'd love to answer questions um, from those who are live and then, um, you know, in the room, and then, of course, those who are live um, joining us. So thank you. All right. Oh, okay. See this one? Well, this one. Yep. There we go. That was really interesting. So we have a blank agenda for today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> First thing that um, Susan and I will go through kind of an introduction to blockchain. And then uh, next we'll cover um, sovereign identity. And then we'll also cover in the end, um, you know, the law of tokens. So I think that we've got a lot of good information that we'll be covering. Um, we wanted to kind of start out and say, why are we here today? You know, society in general, um, I love this kind of Houston, we have a problem. We have a lot of data. In 10 years from today, we will double our data every 12 hours. So as of, as you see here, this is every 60 seconds, you know, over 4 million videos viewed. I think those are mostly by my 12 and 14-year-olds. Uh, uh, but we've got a lot of Google searches, you know, 3.5 million. I mean, it, it's amazing and outstanding 
um, to see that how much technology and how much data is honestly being used every minute uh, that we breathe. So go ahead and let's jump to the, the next slide. We'd love to go into to an update on um, you know what is blockchain kind of give that primer initially we will be discussing more on the primer end of things because we do know that most people are just getting into blockchain and just getting into some of the specific areas we'll talk about today so what is blockchain so let's go to the next slide we go to slide 14 there we go now the pre blockchain world um, if we think about why we put blockchain in place, we have to kind of look at the pre-world and what that looked like, let's say even, you know, three to five years ago. You know, business networks, um, they, they benefit from connectivity. The participants are, of course, our customers, our suppliers, our banks, and our partners. We have cross-geography starting to happen. You know, we, instead of trading between us and our neighbors, we've moved from trading cities to cities to tr now trading globally where I can purchase something very easily from someone in China and then of course someone in China can very easily purchase things from me. Um, it is a little tougher than uh, it will be in the future with of course blockchain. Now assets of course are anything that are capable of being owned or controlled to produce value. So that could be everything from people trading chickens with a goat to everyone change, trading um, financial, uh, different financial things worldwide. Now, where everything is kept, of course, is a ledger, and that'll be the base of our discussion today. A ledger is a system of record for the business, um, and a transaction is an asset transfer on or off of that ledger. So let's head, go ahead and go to the next slide. So. In general, uh, blockchain is a distributed ledger technology allowing any participant in the business network to see the system of record. One of the things that we love about blockchain is that it's decentralized. Um, what we've had in the past has always been centralized. There's always been someone who has been kind of that overarching, overlooking one, you know, one person or one group looking at an entire uh, ledger for maybe a company or an individual. Now we have it decentralized where all of the individuals there's a lot of transparency and all the individuals within an ecosystem or within a network can see each other's, um, each other's blockchain and actually see what is going on within each individual's ledger. So if we go to the next slide. Okay, some of the key concepts we'll go through today um, are of course uh, shared ledger, um, as you've heard before, append only distributed system of record shared across business networks. Also, we'll go a little bit into smart contracts, but we probably need to have a whole session on this one. You know, it's, it is um, the new contracts of the future, and actually they're being used by many businesses today. Um, we're embedded, embedded in the transaction or you know, code and information that, that, relies, that the smart contract relies, relies specifically on to keep the contract safe. So we also have, well, let's talk a little bit about privacy and then, of course, consensus. Now, one of the positive things about, actually three of the positive things about blockchain is it reduces time. So your transaction time can go from days to nearly instantaneous immediately. It removes cost, uh, overhead and cost intermediaries. You know how we're all paying um, ATM fees, you know, a buck here, three bucks here, sometimes depending if you're in Vegas, maybe 6.95, <laughs> kind of can get expensive depending on where you are in the world. Um, with Bitcoin and with other types of cryptocurrency, we're starting to see a lot of those costs being removed. And then as one of my favorite parts is reducing risk and really knowing who you're trading with. So if we want to go to the next slide. Uh, Susan, so share with us a little bit about some of the definitions that you've seen that you think are important for those attending today to know. So I've made a, a list of definitions. Um, of really, these are key concepts that I think anybody needs to understand if they're going to be involved in this technology. And I don't think that a definition, whether you're a lawyer or a business person, you need to understand these definitions. So it, it's cross applicable. And I think the tech people need to understand the way that the business and lawyers are also understanding this. I'll fix it while you're talking. Yeah, this plays a little bit. So, you know, I've defined, we've defined distributed ledger, which you uh, had a brief definition from Shauna. Uh, there's no central administrator is something that's very key. 
shared uh, immediately upon uh, a transaction happening. So in a practical term, so imagine something, I, I've done a lot of work in the insurance industry, imagine that you are managing a claim. It means that everybody can look at that claims database all at the same time and there is nothing to reconcile. So the power of this is that there's one spot that everybody can look at with one record that you call the truth of the, the transactions, uh, which that is part of the transformative nature of what the tech is. Blockchain is the type of distributed ledger where the transactions are linked. Um, and, and I'm going through these quickly because you've got these written down and because we have two hours and I want everybody to, to have their time to speak. The consensus mechanism can vary across different types of chains. Um, and that is how you validate the transaction. It's also on a public blockchain, a way of maintaining the health of the platform and the incentive to keep the platform maintained. Uh, a private chain somewhat similarly, but they're, they're slightly different in the way that they work. There are different consensus mechanisms, so that's the takeaway that you should understand and different takeaway. And the consensus mechanisms have implications for amount of energy used, for amount of uh, record keeping that goes on, et cetera. So just something that you should know about. Smart contract is a written code or protocol that is embedded in the ledger. It is automated and um, should mimic, we hope, the words that are in an actual contract if you're using it as a legal document. Uh, whether it does or not, that is up for something up for development, code auditing, and legal auditing. Um, nodes are the way that you enter the system, so that's just a term that you need to know. Um, it is your computer that is entering into the, the network or platform. Cryptocurrency, I'm sure that you all have heard about that. That's a digital currency that uses cryptographic techniques for governance and security. That's your Bitcoin, Ether, XRP from Ripple, et cetera, anything that's made the news in the past two months. Uh, Bitcoin is a type of cryptocurrency. It's been around since 2008. It has withstood a number of attacks and still seems intact where you have seen the attacks succeed have been in the on ramps or off ramps to the cryptocurrency, the wallets and other um, ancillary parts of the crypto, but not the actual crypto itself. ICOs are called initial coin offerings. They are used to raise capital, usually in anticipation of building a platform and a service. Uh, have typically been done versus with startups. However, when we go further on, I'll mention one that was just in the news this week from a regular enterprise. And I think you should know the concept of the public chain, which is Bitcoin or Ethereum or any number of other forks or branches off of those chains. Um, that is the original proof of work uh, cryptocurrency generated chain that started the whole process. And when somebody like Jamie Diamond from JP Morgan says, I'm not really sure what I think about, I'm paraphrasing him, okay? I'm not really sure what I think about Bitcoin, but I really like the technology underlying it. And that's what he's talking about is the technology underlying the public chain or any variation of that. A private chain, uh, and in a public chain, anybody can join it. Anybody in the world can access it as long as you have a computer. A private chain is permissioned, meaning that it is a group of people selected who can join in. So perhaps a banking consortium or when you hear all of the consortiums, those are all generally private groups that are, almost think of it like trade organizations that get together and create a certain network or ecosystem. So that's pretty much the, the definitions. Thank you. I've been waiting a long time for somebody to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, Susan. What is the main thing that we thought we wanted to share? Why should you? I mean, we all have Bitcoin in the news. That I'm sure many of those here today and those watching have been also investing some of their money, or at least you know, looking at it, being intrigued by how much Bitcoin has gone up. But we have a lot of companies, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about IBM for just a minute. IBM has put our entire ledger onto Hyperledger. So we have fully um, immersed ourselves into blockchain, and we had last year over 400 different blockchain 
projects that we worked on um, that are still in the works with many companies such as we see here today. So um, for those on the, the panel, Michelle, Laura, and Susan, do you want to take a, a few minutes to talk about the projects that you're aware of at these companies? Sure, I was going to take this because, I mean, why this matters to you and the rest of the world is because it affects every single industry globally. It's not a software update. It's a network or ecosystem that's being created. And if you can have one takeaway from this, it should be that you are creating a new marketplace model. And in that sense, there's lots of things that open up for that. And you can also imagine that the first to a marketplace is a market maker. The last is a laggard and may actually not quite make it because markets have a way of sort of having an exponential effect once you get them going. So every industry is affected, which means that every area of law is affected. So I wanted to frame that up and talk about so public or government registries. So you look at land title, you look at birth and death records and something that, you know, may be a little bit controversial like voting. Um, financial services, we have announced projects from the Australian Stock Exchange to do their back end on blockchain. We have an announced project by the DTCC to do all of the swaps clearing on blockchain by the end of 2018. When I talk about blockchain for those, those are private blockchains. When I talk about blockchain for public and government registries, those are more, pub those are more public blockchains. So blockchains have different uses for different types of projects. Uh, insurance, we have a reinsurance consortium going to develop a project that will be out at the end of this year. We have um, policies and claims being put on insurance and insurance certificates just announced yesterday. Digital rights, this is where I said we have the Kodak coin, which you might have heard about. So Kodak announced that it was doing a ICO or a coin to track digital images so that the producers could really get credit for this and get paid for it. So you can imagine digital rights management is really great use for this kind of technology as is music rights. So expect that there will be some projects going on. I know I can't say, but I, I know that there are projects that you'll see announced in that coming up in 2018 because it's all digital rights management with the idea to democratize and get the original creator some more um, compensation back for what they've produced and more control over the content. Supply chain logistics, I need, I would be remiss to not say that there was something yesterday, UPS and Penske have a logistics, so they just joined further the logistics supply chain to examine this. But today's biggest announcement was Maersk, which has signed up for the joint venture with IBM, Maersk owns 51%, and they will be putting uh, the shipping on a blockchain. And it is estimated it's supposed to be on a joint venture starting at the end of this year. And they've estimated that on the first day of operation, 18% of the world's shipping will then transact through that platform. They intend to sign up customs and shipping agents as well. So you can see that that's really a sea change. That's huge. If you get the world shipping, then what else do you have? You have the finance that goes with it. You have the insurance that goes with it. It affects many other industries. Uh, healthcare, energy, travel. You've got Lufthansa, that's why up there, up there, they're doing an ICO or have announced an ICO doing travel rewards. Crowdfunding done through ICOs sort of pirates the money away in some way from venture capital in the more traditional sense. Forecasting, you've got humanitarian concerns as well. There's a fair amount of interest on the humanitarian side. You've had a piloted project through the refugee camps where uh, money is distributed so that refugees can buy groceries and it's tracked back to the original donors. And that's been very successful and is alive. Um, currently, UNICEF just gave out a, an open call for blockchain startups to show up to their door and ask for funding for projects that might affect what they're doing. That's live. You've got the Diamond Providence, Fish Providence, you've got an automotive coalition, and so on. So. The, re the reason that I go into such broad amounts is because every area of law is going to be affected. Every area of business process is going to be affected. And so that people understand how broad sweeping this is. But I know with your work at the UN, you've seen a lot of, um, a lot of this firsthand and what different company countries are doing. 
Um, yes, uh, with varying levels of, of success. I think one of the bigger projects that they're looking at in one area that we're going to talk today, and Laura is going to talk about it, is self-sovereign identity and the drive to actually put the fifth of the world's population that doesn't have identity, give them identity through some form of blockchain-driven, self-sovereign um, type of system. So I know that that's something there. I know that benefits distribution is a big deal. I know that you know UN Women was looking at supply chain for for some of this. It it's in varying stages, um, but the humanitarian side is pretty active. And you can also so one another takeaway that I think that I have from working both sides of enterprise and the UN side is that. Oftentimes in, a, in countries where there's nothing, there is really very little infrastructure that already exists. Putting in a new technology is not as imposing as trying to go over a legacy system. It has its own issues because you're putting in a technology, but it isn't like you had an incumbent that you needed to fight in the beginning to get out of the way or to integrate a bunch of systems because nothing existed. So in a lot of ways, the democratization of a financial reach might really be helped with this kind of technology. And because it's in the wild, because they have absolutely nothing else, so why not go with it? They're willing to go, I've asked this question of them, they're willing to go with projects that are brand new. Industry can certainly take a page and understand what goes on in the wild because they're going to see it actually in action. So there's a fair amount of learning that can be done and partnering that can be done to understand as well as doing some social good along the way. Might as well plug that, but um, there, there definitely is a lot, a lot to be said because they're both streams are happening at the same time because the technology is all being developed and applied at the same time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and I know that we have um, kind of shared here, although you've just mentioned quite a few of these, but areas of laws affected by blockchain. You know, one of the questions that I have is, um, when is the right time to legislate or regulate um, new technologies? So that's a question that is, um, has been a big question sort of throughout my career and, and is a great interest to me because you have technologies emerging that you, know, you have, to have two choices, right? You can shove them into existing law that was written and didn't contemplate those technologies at all. Or you can try to make new laws to address the issues presented by those technologies. But the technologies are continuing to emerge and develop. And when I mean, you look at all these use cases and all of these, you know, whether it's a cryptocurrency versus a sh uh, shipping, um, smart contracts for shipping, you know, getting anybody who makes laws, regulators, legislators, whoever, to understand technologies well enough and figure out when the right moment is to regulate them. And if you look back at the experience of the internet, we are dealing, the Supreme Court this term is hearing arguments um, in the case involving Microsoft about the Stored Communications Act and whether you can get data that's stored offshore. That law is from 1986. They didn't have the internet in 1986. The Stored Communications they were talking about were your phone records. And we're all still living under it. And all of these battles between the FBI and Apple and everything else all go back to a 1986 law that's a pre-internet era law that we, you know, and so does that make sense? No. Possibly not. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> um, on the other hand, you know, the internet companies, and I was one of the primary people doing this, spent a lot of time trying to keep um, the internet free of regulation and have things like uh, immunity for ISPs under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, arguably, which allows, you know, uh, the internet companies not to be liable for third party content. Arguably that, not even that arguably, that paved the way for things like Russian bots and anonymous speech and all the craziness that we're doing you now. By not regulating and by carving out an era where the internet companies are free to do their architecture and allow access, anonymous access, um, you know, and arguably freedom up from any responsibility for the kind of stuff that was going on in their platforms. So if you look at those kind of two two lessons from the internet era, then you start thinking, okay, look at all this new stuff. Uh, what should the rules be? And you know, the other question to think about is, should the rules be? You know, should the problems that are presented by this be addressed by law or technology? And who decides, right? So it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game. If you legislate now or make regulations now, maybe the technology changes to get around it. Probably does. There's a lot of smart minds and a lot, a lot, a lot of money. 
um, around all of these industries. Um, so those are, I mean, those are kind of thematic questions. I think if you look at the, um, the blockchain base, Michelle's going to talk about what the SEC has been doing um, in connection with ICOs and, um, you know, so whether they, you argue, you know, she'll, she'll talk about it talk about now or later, I don't know, um, in terms of whether that's, whether they, they've done a good job in deciding when to step in. When, sure. I think I can, I can briefly talk about that now. We're we're in sort of a mania, a cryptocurrency mania right now. And um, everybody wants to create a token or a coin and, and launch an initial coin offering. And, and the SEC's position is that a case that was decided in the 1940s, um, US v. Howey, is the standard under which uh, it will be decided whether a token is a security that should be um, regulated by the SEC. Um, and while they've they've promulgated that that Howey test will still be used, what they are not doing is making um, broad stroke decisions about every single token. What they're doing is they're bringing actions against specific tokens and giving guidance bit by bit. So there's a lot of there's a lot of unknown, as Laura was saying. We're using an existing framework and we're trying to see how the government adapts a new technology to that existing framework, but we don't have all the, we don't have perfect understanding of what the government's actual view on every single iteration of, of a coin will be. Another area in which the, uh, there's action, the government, you know, sort of after a couple of years of standing on the sidelines of all this, partly presumably because of the incredible volatility in the <laughs> cryptocurrency world, which my colleagues here were just watching on their phones while we had lunch. Um, <laughs> it's been a busy day in the volatility front. Um, is what, you know, the, 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 the Congress is waking up to these issues. They have a blockchain caucus that calls people in sometimes and tries to learn. They don't do much so far. Um, and there's currently legislation pending in the Senate Judiciary Committee, which relates to anti-money laundering provisions, and more legislation pending in the Senate Banking Committee. And I looked at the testimony from the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings in which they talk about cryptocurrency and lots of things like being able to seize cryptocurrency when people come into the country. Seize your, you know, your wallet. Well, there's no differentiation in, in what they've been talking about thus far, and the bill is not yet in final form, between cryptocurrencies. And, and there's kind of every flavor of cryptocurrency that are some that are really seem designed for anonymity and potentially to, to um, enable terrorist funding, you know, ransomware payments, you know, all, all sorts of other sketchy and illegal activities. And others that are completely legitimate and are designed to be legitimate and designed to be compliance with you know your customer and, and AML laws. But the current legislation doesn't draw those distinctions. And though I read the testimony from the witnesses, the witnesses were from the FBI, they were from Homeland Security, they were from you know, commerce. It was there was nobody from the crypto community coming in and saying, "Wait a second, here's the introduction that Susan and it just gave us that Michelle will talk about later." But these are they're not all the same animal. So what you're looking at right now potentially is legislation that could go into place that is not, at least in my view sophisticated, smart legislation that's going to address all the nuances in this emerging area and but then if it goes in and passes and becomes law does it become the dead hand like the sort of communication yeah. act and 30 years from now or 40 years from now we're still stuck with with bad law that didn't even apply at the time it was made so those are all you know issues if you think about law and emerging technologies that's what you have to think about is which which emerges and who wins the cat and mouse game to regulate and to, to and to innovate yeah um that said shauna do you, you want to take it back or you guys well, have I, I have a comment uh, about that so um in terms of the and it also goes to what um, michelle is going to talk about in terms of just regulating a token or a cryptocurrency per se uh, where what's the relationship then between the cryptocurrency and the platform that it's powering and if you're looking at risk is it the cryptocurrency that's the risk is the systemic risk not to keep the platform up and running i mean so Sometimes, and this goes to your point of where you're regulating, does that then skew how a platform might actually form and keep its integrity? And which piece do you, you know, when you, when you stomp out one piece, kind of it's been compared to whack-a-mole, um, then what happens though systemically to the, to the bigger game? 
what are you doing? And what are you providing? What are you enabling? We're going to sort of engineer around it, or does the development of the industry go around around right. this? Right. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that we can do is to really get active in the legislative and regulatory area, um, especially the group and those who are watching today, who actually, who actually this game, can see kind of both sides of the coin. Um, you know, I have a huge concern, especially looking at um, things globally, that we will be regulated or le legislated out as, um, you know, citizens of the United States. So I do want to make sure, you know, that, um, you know, all of our voices are heard when it comes to, you know, regulations and, and legislation. So um, that is, of course, a big concern of mine, and I think, you know, of yours also. That's exactly right. You see legislation right now. Um, I think we haven't even talked about the state level, but if it's a it's a huge global ecosystem, and it, it can't really be adequately ruled by this patchwork at, at micro levels. Yeah. Or national. Well, it is <laughs> interesting because we're asking for centralized bodies like the legislature to then try to legislate something that is decentralized. So it's a bit of a conundrum if you think about it. Um, so it's going to be definitely an interesting decade as uh, things start to hash out globally. Well, and I think, Shauna, the other thing too um, is that a lot of, it goes to what everybody is saying, is that what you, in, an, in an emerging technology environment, when technology is evolving, it should evolve, which means that you need to have a very active and robust DevOps community. Mm -hmm. And if you legislate in a way that they actually can't do that, you're going to push out the good and the bad. So there has to be some accommodation, I think, to allow the creativity and the solutions to emerge. Yeah, you know, I was reading an article this morning, and I thought it was interesting because there are quite a few companies who are looking at moving to Canada uh, from China. And I thought that was interesting, or at least, you know, opening up locations in Quebec, as there was a lot going on there for, um, you know, Bitcoin mining. So it's fascinating to see if areas of the world regulate themselves that we are going to see people and citizens moving or, you know, opening up businesses and other locations that are freer. Um, so let's go ahead and jump to the introduction to self-sovereign digital identity. And, um, you know, this is definitely an interesting area. Let's go to the next slide, because I do want to make sure that all the who are attending really, truly understand this. So, Laura, can you kind of take us through and give us a good primer and kind of make it easy and simple to understand self-sovereign identity? I'm in charge of making sure you all understand. All right, I'll do my best. I was just still stuck on why people were moving to Canada, but that was a whole different. Thing. <laughs> to Canada now. But um, just the coins only one of them. Um, so, so um, self-sovereign identity is an idea. It's at the moment it's it's more an idea, and there are sort of prototypes and efforts underway. There is not really, in most ways, an active functioning. Um, use case for blockchain in terms of a widespread usage. But it's an idea that under that underlies a lot of, of issues and, and addresses, you know, so, and Susan will talk a little bit about this, addresses a number of issues across blockchain and cryptocurrency and you know your customer and everything else. But it's a really, it's a kind of a simple idea, if you can imagine getting your mind around it, which is that you would have a lifetime portable identity that's your identity, that's your personal data, that, that belongs to you and it is, doesn't depend on any centralized authority so that when you need and it can't be taken away from you so anytime you need to better verify your identity you can do that by sharing only the amount of data in the way that you want to and then it isn't it isn't dependent on centralized authority so how does that work it basically decentralizes the control over your personal data so that you don't have a government saying you have to share this, or a business with whom you've shared it using your data in ways that you don't want it to be used. So the the back end of it is that the uh, the blockchain, distributed ledger technology, and encryption together will provide secure and immutable identity records, and you can use to share some or all of that information with any party with whom you went to a transaction. Um, and you can only choose if you have concepts in privacy law. These days, I'm mostly a privacy law about minimum necessary, that you only share the minimum necessary data for a transaction. That's not the way 
by and large, data is shared in the United States now. It's about to be, presumably, in Europe under the new GDPR. But that, that aside, if you, you know, this is a simple kind of silly example, but if you go into a bar and you would like to have a drink, and if the bartender's feeling generous because I'm old, and ask me for an ID to prove that I can have a drink, the bartender now knows where I live, he knows my middle name, he knows how much I weigh, which I really don't want to know. <laughs> he knows whether I need corrective lists to draw. The bartender does not need to know that, right? And it, what the, all the bartender needs to know is, is he, is he going to be in violation of some law if he gets injured? So the idea of being able to share electronically, and not even necessarily share your birth date, which is personal data, but to share a validator that's validated by the blockchain that you are, in fact, of sufficient age to get a drink is all the bartender needs. So that's the concept behind the um, self-sovereign digital identity is that you control it and you only share what you want to share with anybody at a given time. So what are the challenges that um, that digital identity is intended to solve? Is it, is it, is it, is it, right, problems that it solves or will solve, we hope. Um, account creation. So including validation of identity or other attributes. Every time you go open a bank account or any other kind of account, right, you have to prove your identity. You have to have a passport or a driver's license or all sorts of other stuff or a certificate. Um, the cost and inconvenience of multiple account registrations. If you are to go, you know, to the, you move, you need a new bank account, you need to go to the DMV, you need a bunch of other stuff. You have to spend all that time with each of those entities proving your identity in the format that they want it proven and bringing, you know, that piece of mail that shows your mailing address to get your driver's license, all that kind of stuff in a different format for everybody. And you have to take a day or two days off work to do this. That in theory would go away. The, um, the inconvenience, this is a nicely put, I borrowed somebody else's language here, inconvenience and insecurity of multiple usernames and passwords. Let's face it, that whole system is dead. It is, it is no longer a functional system in many ways. How many times a day do you sign in? You have no idea what your password is. Unless you're using a password keeper, you're not, you, you either are using the same one over and over, which you're not supposed to do because it's very insecure, or you keep forgetting them and getting a new one set, which just adds chaos and time. And then if it's, the system's compromised, you know, you have a panic over Equifax and other breaches, you have a broken system. Um, so in theory, digital identity would resolve that system. Um, and that goes to identity theft and account takeover as well. Um, once your identity is, has been compromised of the current system or using it and password, anything is available you know, to hackers or to people who are stealing you. Um, interoperability, that's really you know, data portability. If you've given it your data to one system and you change, you get sick of them, right? You don't really want them to have your data anymore. There is a barrier to transferring. Um, if you're changing, you know, your cell phone provider or your uh, internet uh, address, there are barriers between taking all the data that you've collect, collected or created in any in any um, environment that is essentially owned by whoever you gave it to, even though it's your data, because they've got it in a way that you have to recreate it somewhere else. So this would this would allow interoperability and portability. Um, and then finally. There's the problems that Susan talked about that are, so that those are all kind of what I call, and I'm not sure if this is say this anymore, but I do it um, first world problems, developed world problems. We're all worried about hackers and databases and who took our, who got, has access to our Bitcoin wallet. In the, in the developing world, there are an estimated billion people worldwide who are just un, unidentified. They, they lack any official form of identification. And what that prohibits them from doing is you know, pretty much anything other than living a subsistence life. You can't register for school, you can't get a bank account, you can't vote. You can't do a lot of things. If you are a refugee or a person, there's a lot of migrants, obviously issues going on now, whose documents have been lost, how do you ever prove your identity? How do you move to a new country and establish a new trust and a bank account and all these things? This is a real problem worldwide. It's a huge problem. And that's part of what the UN has been working on is this effort to have everybody in the world have some sort of official identification by 20, what's 2020, but it's not 2030. No, 2030, 2030 for that. 2020 was when the plan should be put in place. 2030 mm -hmm. is when it should be fully implemented. So that, those are all the problems. The same technology 
would, in theory at least, solve those two kind of fairly disparate sets of problems, right? And a lot of people that are migrants are not worried so much about username and passwords and Equifax, but there are two very real problems around identity, and there are others um, that that this technology could um, indeed, you know, solve. Can I, may I um, offer one little little augment um, from the media lab's perspective? Um, and <clears throat> you often don't see it in these slides on self-sovereign identity, so it's noteworthy. And, I want to make sure also you guys get something out of think here so you can find out somewhere over the horizon a little bit. But um, as we've been working on self sovereign identity, on the business side of the mic, um, one of the, and we look at what's different with blockchain technology in particular. Um, for those of you that haven't done the wallet, um, when you get a wallet, there's automatic key generation, it creates an address for you, and you tra do transactions basically. From, from and to that address, and it's and the main identifier, as well as the main mechanism and method of uh, using identity is that key pair. So it's a, it's a hash of the public key and the key pair on blockchain, uh, on Bitcoin blockchain, for example. So in the 90s, um, the big thing with identity and digital identity was digital signatures, digital signature guidelines from ABA, and electronic signature legislation and so forth. That's an important mechanism of identity, we could say. So one of the and, and so we took a look last semester and made progress. And um, if you go to law.mit, you can look at get the open source code here demos on just leveraging the address on a blockchain as a um, mechanism for expressing authorization, consent, assent to a contract. Um, these are um, other indicia of identity that frequently don't make it into the sort of more an account based on identity management slide set. I mean, maybe they don't belong there necessarily, it might be a different slide, but because the identifier, which is the public key, like a core, like the core attribute of identity would be like you know, your social security number uh, out here, um, but on a blockchain it's your public key, like, uh, connected to your address, also is connected to the private key by which we express Agreements, um, you know, about which we digitally sign things. Um, it seemed like it went to, well, we look at self sovereign identity. How do we agree to government in the United States? The basic concept is we, it's got legitimacy by consent of the government. You know, we, we sign things, we vote, we um, authorize. This is um, the, the pointy end of the stick of identity. So there's, I think there's something in there, you know, it needs to keep baking a little bit, but there's probably another little square that relates to the. Um, key pair and the um, mechanism of authorization and agreement um, from blockchain is something that's maybe even di it's different from a translation of account systems with digital identity to a blockchain world and frankly better it might be the way we bridge the gap from identities that existed centuries past to how we how we can um, refactor it for the digital age so um, log.mit.edu come get your open source code and play with it yourself Great, thanks, Joseph. Thank you. So, you know, I, I want to make sure I have time for Michelle's presentation, but there's some, I guess one of the, you know, some of the questions are, you know, what what legal issues and risks are presented and opportunities are presented by the, you know, we've heard the opportunity side, but what are the legal issues if you were to go into a regime of self-sovereign identity? And are those issues, will those issues be resolved by law or by technology? So, you know, what, why, where I get stuck on it to some extent is who, who controls the permissions? This is all decentralized. When you think about, if you think about a public blockchain, you know, sort of anybody who wants to sign themselves up can sign themselves up to have a Bitcoin wallet. Well, if anybody can sign themselves up for an identity, how's that a good identity, right? How, how do we know that you're really who you say you are? So, do, you know, in a, with a technology that is a whole, the whole point is decentralization. It's interesting if you think about criminal you know, changes and once you've got your personal data and you add stuff to it, you're going along with that. But if you back up to the very beginning of digital identity, how on the first, in the first instance, a baby is born or Susan wants to be identified, who decides that Susan's really Susan? And so that's, I mean, one of the first issues is who's, who's in charge, what's the, you know, how, how is, partly it's how is the blockchain structured. And the way this has been discussed is what they call a public permissioned, which is a hybrid between a public blockchain and a private blockchain, it lets everybody in, but there is some administrative oversight body, and they've talked about it being governed by a foundation, for example, a very diverse foundation, so that geographically, in different industries, different roles, so that nobody, there's no central authority, 
but the foundation itself becomes central authority. But there's a lot of legal issues to think about that, you know, and you think about different cultures. I, mean, I have two kids. I'm pretty sure I know whose kids they are, but how, you know, here we have a system of, of birth certificates. It's, and as you know, think lots of cultures are history, you can usually figure out who the mom is. There are, you know, other issues, provenance issues, shall we say. <laughs> you know, but, you know, the but, you know, you have to, there, these are going to be legal issues to be, to be thought about. Um, and are they solved by the structure of the, some of them can be solved by the public relation blockchain, but are they solved by legal structures or consensus around the foundation or by some kind of technological fix? Um, lots of privacy issues, right? So if everything you have, all your data is on this immutable chain and it's stored forever, what if you, you know, what if you don't want it all there, even if you're not always sharing each piece of it with whoever you're interacting with? In theory, there is a permanent record of it all somewhere. Is that something you know you want? Um, and how does that work with existing, or exactly not even existing, still future, still to be activated law, mm -hmm. the GDPR, which is the European Future of Privacy Law, coming in in May of this year? This would already conflict with that because it allows a, a right to be forgotten, or a right of right of erasure, they call it. So you can erase some of your data if you'd like to. That doesn't work really with the blockchain. So what happens there? Um, and what happens to anonymity? I mean, we've all agreed, we're going to talk a lot about, um, about the, the downside of anonymity, right? Criminals tend to like anonymity, anti-money laundering folks, the trolls on the internet. But there are some things that people want to do in life and some valid things you would like to be able to do anonymously. You'd like to not necessarily be tracked back to you. You have to, you, know, you have to prove who you are to vote, but your vote is private. Um, so what happens, um, what about things like blind adoptions, where you are, you give up a child and their identity changes in order they, they're adopted by someone else and they're not able to go back and find their parents? How do you change an identity in the witness protection program? You know, how does all this work if you have an immutable chain? So all of those kinds of issues, um, you know, are, would have to be addressed either, again, legally or technologically, if you move to a system of digital identity. Um, and then, you know, there's, I don't want to say that there's the whole security issue, which is that, although, I guess Susan said, the, you know, the underlying algorithm has seemed quite secure, relatively secure thus far. You know, I, I got into this area of law because I was involved in responding to a, a big Bitcoin theft, which was at the time $72 million worth of Bitcoin. And I don't even have the heart to tell you how much money that is now. <laughs> it's like, it's just staggering. And, and actually a lot of those, you know, they think, um, North Korea was behind, so again, huge stress was more wealth. But leaving that aside, if you think of that as a, as a cache of, of a huge transfer of wealth, this is a cache, this is like the mother of all data breaches, right? If there is a way that this is compromised and you're watching of identity data somewhere and it gets either stolen or corrupted, things get moved around and you get my identity and I get yours or I get someone else's, you know, all of that, um, you know, what are the safeguards on the user's private keys? How is that secured? Is it secured again by law or techn by technology? So you know, as, as these, I'm just using all this kind of as an example of all the things you have to think about, and that's there's plenty more, no doubt. Um, when you start to think of, a, of a, a cool technology that solves lots of problems, it also creates a whole bunch of other problems that have to be addressed. So, so thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Michelle, I thought we'd start on um, just kind of an introduction to token law, but help us understand first off, what is a token? So a, a token is a is a digital representation of of value in essence. Um, we we have all heard of, of the cryptocurrencies of Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and Monero and um, Ethereum, um, but we're in a we're in an atmosphere where a lot of people and companies are now creating their own tokens and those tokens trade on various exchanges and they're offered to people through um, white papers and there's a lot of uncertainty about um, what your what your token actually is defined as is it a commodity is it a security is it a piece of property could it be all of those things and the answer is yes and who who regulates um the tokens and so we find ourselves in this in this web of 
of law where different government agencies are in charge of um, making sure that that the token issuers and the, and the exchanges that are allowing trades and the people who are purchasing tokens and the people who are creating hedge funds that invest in tokens, that everybody complies with the relevant law, which was enacted and had never foreseen the fact that we had something called a token. Um, so who, so I think it's good to think about who are the re US regulators that actually regulate cryptocurrencies. You have banking regulators, you have the IRS, you have treasuries, um, financial crimes enforcement network, you have the SEC and you have the CFTC. I could probably spend about six hours going through what each of these different arms of the government do and how they regulate. I'm gonna to focus today because of all the um, hype that's going on with the, the mainstream um, tokens. I'm gonna to focus today just on SEC and CFTC regulation um, and talk a little bit about those frameworks and how we should be looking at tokens and what are the different um, securities and related issues. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about, about the Howey test. The SEC's approach to regulation of tokens is key to whether um, a security is an investment contract and the way that you, um, whether a token, excuse me, is an investment contract such that it's a security. And so the Howey test has the Howey test has um, has four prongs, and again, it's a test from 1946 in a case that involved parcels of an orange grove. So we've we've come from we've come from sales of interest of an orange grove to um, regulating whether the Dow token is a is a security or not. Um, so the the four prongs are whether there's investment of money, two in a common enterprise three with the expectation of profits, and four derived from the entrepreneurial and managerial efforts of others. And really what we've seen a lot of recently in terms of the regulation is that focus on the third prong, the expectation of profits, and the difference between if there is an expectation of profits, you're almost certainly going to pass the Howey test, and you're gonna be deemed a security versus if you, if you fail um, and you don't have an expectation of profits. So if we roll back to July, uh, the SEC issued a report of an investigation under um, Exchange Act 21A called the Dow Report. Now, the SEC uh, investigates companies and it can bring enforcement actions, but it can also write a report and decide not to bring an enforcement action and instead just educate the market and say, we found a violation of the securities law, but we're not actually going to enforce the securities law against the company or the organization because everybody sort of didn't know. And so that would be inherently unfair. So we're going to tell you what the results of our investigation are, and we're going to give you guidance. And then normally what you see is a sort of slew of cases that come on its heels and the warnings out there. So the Dow report involved an investigation of the Dow, um, and sort, uh, which is an unincorporated organization, Slocket, which was a German entity, and Slocket's co-founders, and certain intermediaries, and whether they violated the securities laws by not registering um, the, the Dow token. Uh, the Dow token represented interest in an enterprise and could be paid for with virtual currency. Um, they could be held as investments. They had voting rights and ownership rights, and they could be sold on secondary platforms. Applying the Howey test, the SEC determined that the Dow token was actually a security and it should have been registered. It sent sort of waves through the market with everybody thinking, I just issued a coin, is my coin a security? No, my coin's not a security, it's a utility token. But wait, I told the market that they were gonna expect a profit. There was sort of a whole mess of, of, of chatter out there and, and not not a lot of direction. So what did we see after? We saw actions in September, October, December. Um, we saw a bunch of actions, SEC v. Recoin, which involved um, fraud in connection with the coin issuance that was supposedly backed by real estate and diamonds. We saw SEC versus Garza in October, which related to the fraudulent offering of unregistered securities in a Ponzi scheme. We saw SEC v. PlexiCorp in December, which saw the halt, actually, of an ICO, the government actually going in before the coin was offered 
doing an asset freeze, again, because of fraud. And then finally, we saw something really interesting. We saw the Munchie case um, in December. And what's interesting about Munchie was that the, there was supposed to be a coin offering and there was a pre-sale and there was absolutely no fraud alleged by the SEC. It was really just the mere determination by the SEC that the token was not a utility token, that, that Munchie had, had put statements out there and blog posts um, in their white paper saying that there was an expectation of profit and they went in and, and Munchie stopped the ICO and said, we understand that we fail, we passed the Howey test and they returned all the money to the investors. So again, another message to the market, you're, you're doing everything right. You're not, you're not doing a Ponzi scheme. You're not, you're not perpetrating fraud, but you made the wrong determination, right? You're, you're, you made the wrong determination. We've seen a lot of uh, statements by, by Chairman Clayton, which uh, they were informal statements. He had made one at, at Georgetown and, and sort of off the cuff had said, well, I, I don't think I ever met a, a token that wasn't a security. And, and those remarks were reverberated as well. Um, and then he actually put out a statement a, a few weeks ago and, and he said, he said we, we do use a case by case basis. And he gave an example of something that would be a utility coin. And that would be a participation in a book of the month club. And so you could issue tokens and you could use the money raised from those top tokens to invest and fund acquisition of books and help the distribution of books. But really, your token was a participation interest. And that's really the key. Is your token being used? That's why it's called a utility token. Is your token being used to support the enterprise? Not because I think I'm going to gain a profit from the book exchange, but because I'm going to get some use out of um, the token. Um, and so it, it's been a very sort of interesting ride that we've had. Um, and this is really to say nothing of the fact that there's also investment advisor issues and investment company act issues. You know, there are people out there who are giving advice to other people, whether they should invest in cryptocurrencies. Does that make that person an investment advisor who has to register? If you form an LLC to invest um, in in tokens, you know, are you now an investment company? And so the law is, is really, we're watching a, a huge sea of change. Um, so I focused a lot on, on the SEC and I want to, in fairness, talk about the CFTC. So we know that the SEC can deem that your token is a security. In um, 2015, the CFTC, which has oversight of futures, options, and derivatives, contracts, determine that Bitcoin and other digital currencies are commodities. And if you think in your head, you actually can be a security and a commodity at the same time, but we definitely know that the cryptocurrencies are commodities. And the CFTC has fostered development of the digital currency market. They've permitted registration of a swap execution facility, uh, listing Bitcoin swaps, which is the Terra exchange. They've, um, they've permitted trading Sorry, they've permitted Ledger X, a swap ex execution facility, and an exchange, list, exchange listing binary options called Terra Bitcoin Price Index. Um, but they've also brought in enforcement actions. People sometimes call me and say, is this a security? And could somebody um, from the SEC come after me? And, and perhaps we can make a determination um, once we have enough information, but you also have to remember that, that it's definitely a commodity. So the CFTC has jurisdiction and they've taken a really broad stroke. If they see fraud in connection with a commodity, they've brought, they've brought at least one case, which was CFTC versus Gelfman Blueprint. And that was back in 2017 and related to a hedge fund that was basically, uh, high returns when it, when it, actually was misappropriating the investments. Um, so that's part of the, fright, the federal regulatory landscape that we have. And because we have a government where states can also regulate, we have to think about what each individual state is doing. And we've seen, um, we've seen Texas, Massachusetts, and North Carolina become very, very active in this space. Um, Texas and North Carolina both suspended securities, uh, the securities regulators in those states um, issued emergency halts of operations of um, BitConnect, which is a UK cryptocurrency marketplace. 
And the Massachusetts Secretary of the Commonwealth said that he was, quote, going to begin a sweep of entities in the state who are raising uh, capital by ICOs. Um, we know that in New York, um, if you want to be a money transmitter or have an exchange that accepts um, or transmits money, you need to get a bit license from the Department of Financial Services. So on top of the federal framework, you also have to be cognizant of the state framework. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on, and as Laura had mentioned, um, are the regulations that are currently in place, the regulations that should be in place, or the regulations that actually are, are, are they outdated? Are they usable in the framework? Do we need to legislate? We don't even know what the courts are going to say because no court has opined on any of these um, cases brought by the SEC or, for that matter, plaintiff's class action firms. A lot of people issue tokens and they're worried about the SEC. I'm sure the, the SEC can come after you, but a plaintiff's class action firm can also come up after you for failing to register your security, um, which creates significant liability. So um, what I've tried to do is I've tried to give you a brief overview of of the state of play of, of token law from the SEC and the CFTC standpoint and a little bit of state regulation. Um, and that's uh, pretty much Can I uh, sure. mention um, the derivatives trading, what they have allowed the CFTC? Because we do have derivatives trading going on. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, there's the, the CFTC has approved, um, they've approved exchanges for, for derivatives trading. Um, there's there's a swap execution facility and derivatives clearing organization, Ledger X, that has approval. It's not that the it's not that there's not that our government is not encouraging the development of this of this marketplace, but they're they're regulating it slowly. On the other hand, there were two applications for um, exchange exchange traded funds that were recently um, pulled from SEC review because the SEC, one of their main concerns is liquidity. Um, and it's hard for them to approve a fund if they don't know if there's going to be enough liquidity. Um, so I hope that answers your, your but question. But there, I mean, there is, at least uh, in my view, the the allowance of Bitcoin derivatives to be traded, um, CBOE, et cetera, mm -hmm. that is a, a regulator kind of saying, OK, we can put a few parameters around this and allow this within our rules. So I, I just wanted to make a point that I didn't think they were only saying no, because mm -hmm. I don't think that they no, are. But different parts of the government moving at different speed. In fact, when the, the CFTC was doing that, you had the SEC and, and the Treasury Secretary saying, wait, 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 why are you guys going so fast? Mm -hmm. Hang on, you know, and so there's a, there's a push-pull even in the administration, even you know, in, the, in the government itself as to how, what's the right answer here, how fast do we need? And I think there's um, time for testimony on that coming up is it at the end of February. February. We're going to um, have conversations about those decisions. Right. So maybe now's a good time, I don't know if uh, Shauna, if you have, uh, we're gonna go into another piece, but maybe it's time to take questions um, if anybody here has some. You know, I know. Yeah. That real quick, I wanted to kind of go through some career advice. I'd love to talk a little bit about how each of you are in this area and some career advice for those in the room and those, of course, uh, watching. So, how did you get into this? Michelle, do you want to start? <laughs> um, I was actually at a party about a year, a year and a half ago, and I had, I had, um, no idea what people were were talking about they were talking about about cryptocurrencies and things that i had never heard about and i was incredibly in intrigued mainly because they were so animated about it and they were so passionate about it about something new and about blockchain and this technological revolution and and at the time that i started learning about it there really wasn't a ton of, of materials that were all in one place and you kind of have to go to your uh, sources that you you were able to determine were legitimate and had good information. Um, so I, I'm mostly self-taught, but I thought you know this is this is the change of of a landscape, and this is technology that is going to affect every industry. And while I was trained as a securities lawyer, and and so my initial inclination was was to lean toward the token issues. 
um, I've really come, my, most of my practice has, has really concerned helping companies that are getting into blockchain, purchasing companies that are, that are interested in blockchain technology and helping those companies do those deals and, and comply with all the various regulations there are um, because this is so forward thinking. Um, I think, you know, when I, when I always tell this story, when I started college and they gave me an email address and they explained to me how to use email, it, it was beyond my comprehension that I could type in an address and that my friend at, at Harvard was going to receive an, something on the computer. It just, it didn't make sense to me. And there was that, that sort of excitement when you went to the computer lab and you checked your email account, like how many messages were there going to be from how many different people. Um, and now it's, it, it's almost silly to think about it that way. But I think, you know, the people who you talk to say, I've, I've never heard of this blockchain thing. They're the same people who two years from now will probably, you know, be use, utilizing it through various companies like it was. And tell me how much more they know than you right. know. <laughs> right. Exactly. So that's my story. So I um, learned about it in a conference. Uh, I had just finished a job as a general counsel at an insurer, and the minute that I heard that reconciliation was God, I was sort of in my head jumping up and down because I understood how it could apply on the enterprise side. So where I've come at this from is on the enterprise side of things, trying to figure out what business processes could be streamlined and what that does to business when they change their view of what an ecosystem is or what a, a marketplace is. Um, I also self-taught myself, started out with that Satoshi white paper and proceeded to go to a bunch of conferences, eventually amassed, a, <laughs> well, I will say also my story is like my family was just, it's Bitcoin, if it's Bitcoin, she'll pay attention. If it's not Bitcoin, we can't get her attention anyway. So. <laughs> Um, my daughter even threatened that if we got a dog, we would name it Blocky. So, <laughs> I'm for not getting a dog. Um, but, um, so a lot of this was, I was fascinated by what I thought it could actually do and wasn't so much on the Bitcoin stuff per se, although I knew it fueled it. But since then, I mean, a lot of what you do is you stay educated. I will say that the best source that I've found in a lot of ways is Twitter, just following the people who, uh, I mean, this stuff moves so fast that Twitter is really a truly a great resource for it. And link the LinkedIn communities. And I surround myself with economists, developers. When I go on a consulting job, I ask for a developer to be paired with me because I understand the logic of the code and I need to make sure that that's going to work sufficiently within a business process. Um, but, and there's a ton of lawyers involved in this. I mean, more lawyers than I ever imagined, but I'm, I'm a lawyer, I, I like lawyers, but there's just a lot of them. So, uh, but more on the law firm side, so you don't see really in-house a lot of lawyers embracing this yet. So there's a huge opportunity for businesses to learn this. There's an opportunity for boards to learn this. There's just, um, there's a lot, a big learning curve still. So that's how I approached it and how I got into it. I would say, you know, I got into this, I was not a technology, technology person really at all. Um, I was a constitutional law person in, in law school. I was a big First Amendment scholar type. Um, I like to think about freedom of the press. And, it's, and then when I, was, I went into private practice and represented media companies. Um, and then the internet happened and all publication, you know, it used to be something got published in the New York Times and you sued the New York Times. It doesn't really work that way anymore. Maybe it's published by the Times, but it's all electronically. And the whole method and timing and the way information spread, you know, you couldn't, you can't just retract it. Um, and so I got recruited to go to AOL early on um, when it was the biggest or becoming the biggest internet company in the world to litigate um, the law of immunity for, for internet companies. And we did that um, quite successfully. And I then stuck around and, and had much broader responsibilities that all involved the legal implications of this new technology. And we built, you know, targeted advertising, which nobody had really done before. And we built all these other things that nobody had done. And they would, would come to me and say, can we do this? I had to figure out if you could. And that's, so I had to learn the technology and fell in love with it and with the business. Um, and then ended up being a much different kind of a lawyer than I thought I was going to be when I started out. And I think that's, you know, that's something to be aware of. This is stuff, and you may not go to it, it may come to you. Um, and if you look at the, you know, the, the, our Susan slides earlier and all these, you know, all the shipping, it's going to come to you. 
It's coming to you right now. So, and it was, uh, Michelle and I were talking earlier about the law firms now. And law firm lawyers, by and large, are not super entrepreneurial. They're pretty cautious. And so, you know, we get these calls and it's like, can you do a Bitcoin trading fund in London with these Russians and these Israelis? And all of our clients are like, no. Um, it really is, we don't, we haven't done that before. Sometimes the answer that we get, we don't have experience in that. But no one does. So it really is about being entrepreneurial and about applying what you know either about the, you know, not even either, about the technology, about the law, about the business, and coming up with the best answer you can come up with. Uh, you know, at least in my experience at AWO, when we did that, we were promptly sued or investigated by everyone in the universe. We had a big budget, so that was good, but that's really how a lot ends up getting made. Um, is you take the best shot you can and then you fight about it and celebrate. Right? Um, you win or you lose and you go on from there. But, you know, that's, and then to, to get into the whole, my entry into the, the blockchain crypto world was I was doing a lot of um, incident response, big data breaches, big hacks, um, and some on the national security side. And the, as I said, a big um, Bitfinex, a, a crypto exchange, Bitcoin exchange was hacked um, and a lot of value went out, disappeared. And the, I learned, I got a call, I was on vacation, can you handle this incident? And it turns out that you can see, you know, on the blockchain where it went, but it's still gone. You know, it, it's been moved, and it's an immutable record that it's been moved, you put to 2,000 wallets, so, you know, in that much time. It's still gone, so what do you do? And thinking about the security issues of private keys and public keys and how the architecture is even though you do have the secure, again, the sound weapon is relatively secure, what are the other issues around it and how it's, you know, this technology in the wrong hands is just as bad as, or you hook it up to the internet, it's just as bad as anything else. So I came to it from that era and, and then got very interested in all the non-crypto and non-cybersecurity related issues like around identity. Yeah. Well, and I, um, of course there are there. Every year we make uh, educational components that are 40 hours or so. And I had saw this little link to blockchain a few years ago and started taking my CLE courses with IBM there and um, really did not get though absolutely fascinated and um, a little bit, I will say I'm a little bit obsessed with blockchain right now as it's my newest thing that I'm learning and diving into and I've dove into the deep end. Um, I was speaking in Russia on a panel at the International Legal Forum, and Paolo Tosca, who's one of uh, the blockchain experts worldwide, he's with the University of London, had spoken, and I just got um, it, uh, totally fascinated, obsessed. Um, there were another, there was another gentleman on the panel um, who's with the University of Sydney, John Flood, and I think John and I kind of both left that conference going, we have to really dive in and uh, see what we can do to help the legal profession, you know, get into blockchain and see what, see what new things we can develop. So that was my forte into it and, you know, kind of similar, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you're like me and probably many of those in the room who are, or who are watching is I spend at least an hour in the morning and an hour before I go to bed reading, looking at um, different things on the internet, Twitter. My weekend this weekend was um, really funny enough, YouTube. I went on and looked at um, quite a few of the uh, cryptocurrency, you know, YouTube videos, and it was kind of funny as I I saw no one my age that were uh, leading the videos. It was all people about half the age, awesome piercings, lots of colored hair, but they've got these super cool companies, and they're all millionaires because they jumped in while the rest of us were kind of standing back, going, "Oh, is this really going to be real?" And they just uh, dove right in. Um, so kind of the risky, I think. You know, ness of being young, uh, which definitely has paid out for so many of them. So I know that we have about twenty-ish minutes. So, and I, I think we've got quite a few people in the room who can ask questions. And then I don't know if we can take questions from uh, those watching. But uh, Daza, what's the best way to do this? Um, <clears throat> I would say, um, who's monitoring Telegram? Anybody? <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Oh, thank you for asking that um, question, um, Shana. I'm always very um, of the moment. And so um, I, I've been just lightly looking at Telegram, but I've seen um, we've got, you know, there's a few ringers uh, up there, and they've got a, I noticed a couple of questions. Do you, can you, uh, oh, sorry. Can you bring I'm scrolling up. I'm scrolling up. Well, one thing that came up is there's a, uh, 
There was an interesting um, observation by um, Al Willis, who's a local um, sort of Ethereum, I don't know, aficionado, um, I suppose, <laughs> um, who comes to a lot of um, legal hackers meetings and uh, MIT classes and meetups in the area and stuff, entrepreneur and a uh, developer. And he was in the Telegram channel and he just sent a, he just thought it was interesting that somebody just deeded their house, apparently, um, to an Ethereum foundation, was it? Oh. Um, and so, I don't know, so there's a link in, in Telegram that you can read all about it. Well, any, any questions? Yeah, so, so one of the early questions was what legally are some of the differences between uh, public and private blockchains and uh, how should people think about this? Right, yeah, that came up when, um, when you were identifying that they were the public and the private and like private and you know, public and permissioned and looking for um, just sort of almost like a way to, a legal framework or from a legal perspective, are they different? Are they the same? Well, I think we could start with the private permissioned first because I don't think that there is a really particularly well set of law on what the public ones are. Um, you know, in some ways the, the private ones are, um, you, you pretty much have an idea of what your rights are because you're in a, in a group. So you're, whether you are in the Maersk trading group, that's gonna be a private one uh, with public interaction or whether you're in a logistics group or wherever. So you, you can define your rights fairly easily among yourselves. Um, it acts more, it's not centralized per se, but acts more in the sense that you know who's there and you can define that. On the public side, I don't know, actually don't really know the answer to that, and I don't know that anybody really knows the answer to I think the whole idea was that. that there wouldn't be, right? Mm -hmm. That it would be that it's the it's the crypto anarchists. Yeah. It's the idea that the whole that Bitcoin and that public side um, blockchains all sprung up to be free of regulation and free of control by centralized authorities, whether they be governments or big banks or anything, all of that in the, in the financial crisis era, the 2008 era. So the whole idea was there wouldn't be any law, there'd be all sorts of anonymity. That's eroding in many ways as, you know, things happen with the Silk Road or with the, or the anonymity erodes and, and law enforcement gets better and things like that. But the idea originally was to sort of everyone sort of self-governed and, and it's governed by consent, the consensus of the blockchain, not by, right. by authority, by law or people or governments. So, but the private ones, you know, as Susan says, you have, um, for example, the way the banks do foreign, um, informed uh, currency transactions. They may all do it using Ripple, using a back end with sort of a private system in which they all communicate and send value to each other. And they will organize the rules of that and law of that presumably by contract. Right. So I mean if you, the public ones are map is to replace government mm -hmm. is kind of how you can abstract it in the photography is government. Right? Yeah. <laughs> government. So I you know I, I'm just in thinking about this in general, I have to wonder it doesn't just spring up. It's not like you and I and anybody else just decided one day, hey, we have a platform here, it is, it's operational. Somebody had to develop that platform. There is some centralization somewhere, right? You don't get a platform without coordinating with people, yeah. then there is something. So the question for me is where are you centralizing? Where are you shifting? And then you look at, you know, who, you know, who do you want to be empowered to run that? Okay. So, can I try to build on that? So, if you're oh, thinking, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Um, my name is Camila. Nice meeting you all. Uh, I'm a Brazilian lawyer with background in antitrust competition and compliance issues. I'm really thrilled to be here. Wins the prize for traveling furthest from his class. And it's definitely worth it. Um, so, uh, if you're thinking about building a business uh, that's based on blockchain, uh, given those differences between uh, public and private blockchains, would you say that the most important thing is to understand the consensus mechanism, uh, just so you have a little bit of control of how things are going to go? I think if you want control, you probably want a private, or at least a sort of a hybrid okay. system like we were talking about with a private per, uh, public permission, but somebody has permission to know who's in it. Um, otherwise, it is, there really isn't much of a control mechanism. If you're building a business, you presumably want to control at least some aspects of it. So that would be end that would be one go. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And the consensus for me goes to the security of the system 
the amount of processing and all sorts of more operational type things that go on with it. I mean, on the public chain, the consensus and the economic incentive are what provide the integrity of the platform. So some variation of that is also what happens in a private chain as well. Uh, so those things must work together. You know, you, you're looking at decentralization, but in a way to incentivize keeping the platforms, I talk about this a lot, with integrity and honesty, because without the platform, what do you have to take in? What, what does that do, right? You need the whole platform. The network is really, I think, I, I don't, I see the question being asked a lot about the tokens, and I just, I, this is kind of my soapbox. I'm like, well, what's the platform? What, what are you talking about? What's it trying to do? Um, how do you keep that going? Okay. Um, so one other, a little bit of color. Um, I'm trying to keep sneaking up behind you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, well, please forgive me. I'm just like, what do you do on here? <laughs> um, but um, coming out of the MIT Legal Forum, which also, you know, um, it not only did it bring us blockchain diversity group, <clears throat> oh gosh, it's like, <laughs> it's like froze. <clears throat> um, it also also brought us um, a group called SOPA um, that um, it's sort of self-organized, and um, we have um, two of the founders actually uh, here in the class, and I was wondering if you come up very quickly and just say how we're fixing to organize this. You don't have to say it, uh, but I, okay, I'll just do it. <laughs> okay, I'll do it you know, basically, I'm trying to do a 10 It's, it's token-based. It's token-based, and, um, and basically... <laughs> well, the, idea, <laughs> the idea is we want, to, we want to understand how do we... Well, first of all, it's a discussion group to talk about blockchain, to talk about AI. Um, so you know, we get together on a mostly a weekly basis, and we have a, we have a lunch, and, Converse, we trade books, we look at hacks, we do things. But we were thinking, you know, what's really interesting is why could we use blockchain to run our group in some way? Some of it was like, you know, how, who's a member and who isn't? Like, we, we all have Slack fatigue. And we're, we're also interested in use, using the technology to maybe represent membership. Um, one of our members was running for city council at the time. And so we were really thinking deeply about the governance aspects. And <clears throat> to model it, just I think one thing that we did that was interesting was we used paper plates at um, Rebooting Web of Trust when it was in Boston mm -hmm. where we had a sort of like our breakthrough meeting where we um, put a symbol we kind of signed a paper plate and that represented our token that was issued um, and it was a physical token so we begin to model the issuance um, to presentation and like the basic functions and flows and who got them and who didn't um, and then maybe begin to look at selecting the right um, blockchain and the right configuration and issuance and you know functions and flows of what the token represent. When it's this came up a couple of times today when it's a membership token, I think in the commodities context. Um, mm -hmm. So when tokens represent membership, what does that mean? And especially when it leads into governance, um, in terms of when we're voting on who's going to be a member and who isn't, I interrogated some people um, as part of membership. And uh, so we're making up the rules for a time. And then also we uh, the other question that I just want to throw out there trademark. So um, Legal Hackers, which is a group that many of us um, participate in and really like, um, is looking to do a trademark. And we're, I learned about a collective mark, a new service mark, a new certification mark, and now other marks. So evidently, there's one from a while ago that, that, that where the trademark represents not origin of goods or anything like that, but it literally represents membership in a group. It's a collective mark. I'll bet you there's an emerging jurisprudence um, that's going to mer that's going to converge at some point on this notion of a membership related token and maybe an introduction of this this element of collective mark or trademark and it might be one of the things if anybody's interested in exploring that in a low key way not you know with like high stakes client you know um, rights and obligations on the on the line <clears throat> I know that our SOPA group is just very much um, uh, like a um, a willing guinea pig uh, and prototyping group, and, and we don't necessarily have high power legal talent, that's for sure. <laughs> We're not necessarily sure what, what's on the horizon or what would be a workable legal framework. So just some very relevant live questions um, you know, from these very halls. Good? Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm the unelected spokesman for that moment, and that moment alone of so bad. Okay, um, Brian? Sure. So uh question on the list was, uh, 
from Brian uh, about whether or not under the current legal framework the U.S. Mint could issue a crypto token, or and maybe whether or not it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't really interested whether or not it was a good idea. I think it was possible. Interesting. Uh, I'll let you take that one. I, you know, I know that there is be, there is research on that being done in experimentation by large companies right now to try and explore that. The question I would have is: so, if you have a digital dollar per se, then what are you going to do for your double spend problem? On that, how are you going to organize it? And um, you know, the larger question that I was talking to, and I'm not an economist, so I'm putting that. One right out there now, but I was talking to a friend who was explaining to me uh, negative interest rates and governments owning and knowing where all of your dollars are and not being able to take your dollars out of the system then the way that you can today and what does that do to money supply and governance. So I think in terms of FedCoin, those sorts of things might want to be explored. That's beyond what I know, but I know that those are issues that our cocktail party issues for me. That's <laughs> as far as I, I can, can get them. But, um, you know, there's a lot of governments looking at FedCoin, and then the IMF has predicted that we will have different kinds of government coins going forward within the next 10 years. I, I don't know what they're working on, but um, it wouldn't surprise me. Does anybody else want to weigh in? <laughs> well, I think you also look at there's been some. Um, news coverage recently of Russia and Venezuela and a couple other Iran, Zimbabwe. Iran, and Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. Some of your rogue nations um, all experimenting or, or going into having their to obey sanctions to using um, essentially their own Fed coins or, or you know government um, supported or authorized or initiated um, cryptocurrencies to evade sanctions. Um, so you're going to you're seeing it in other countries. I, I think that might very well make it likely that you see it here, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, I think actually there's a Caribbean country, but I can't remember which one, which is in the Mendes, so it's transferring its entire economy to the crypto system. Mm -hmm. If you also go to uh, Estonia, it's right, also yes. it's really right. the digital right. identity, you can start already creating a legend of the digital identity. But it's on the private chain, but it's getting in control. So I know in the UN sex, sector that there are projects and com certain tech companies that are looking to build currency that might be tied to the dollar, but digital currencies for countries that don't really have fully functioning banking infrastructure. So in that sense, that might be a really good idea. Um, what else, what other choice do they have is really sort of where it comes down to. And if they do that, then what are you going to learn as a established country from that and maybe can we look, have some lessons learned with that again that's another example where it's easier to do that where there's no sort of existing infrastructure mm -hmm. no and maybe this will tie into the, the next session which i think is around puerto rico and the crib right mm -hmm. so when you have effectively no existing infrastructure to you know to rebuild with a, with a blockchain um, or to build initially you know from the start with a blockchain as opposed to trying to impose you know, currency right in the middle of the U.S. economy, um, which is lots of other existing you know, tentacles into other economies. Um, it may be easier for it to start with a mm -hmm. smaller, less developed country that has challenges in transferring funds because of existing banks or, or systems to do that. I guess one, and one other, uh, I guess, observation by way of we'll begin to wrap in, wrapping, and then um, we, we, I understand for you know, reasons of like human biology and just uh, sensibility psychology when you take a little break before we go to the next session. Uh, but I think it's a particularly good question here from Ringer, Thompson Reuters Labs, Brian, uh, about about whether the mint could, it's just a direct question, um, issue a dollar that was in effect a cryptocurrency coin. Uh, partly because that's really the, um, that's one way to get at what we're trying to do at Law on MIT, I think you and probably why we like panels like yours here um, to educate, to engage us, is which is to look at um, 
not just technically, how could you have um, your sort of like a self uh, authenticating and maybe like a, um, you know, like a self enclosed cryptographic system for coins that people could treat as currency and you know imbue the some of the attributes voluntarily as currency. But what would it look like if we utilize this technology and and um, and look at it um, as fiat currency? Like what what's like what are the statutes and regs and the whole scheme in our payment systems and in our um, you know for everything from secret service down to point to sale? What would it look like to architect a system that was designed deliberately as part of the way we govern ourselves to take advantage of, of the of the good properties and um, opportunities of the technology, um, but the way that we do it may not be as hierarchical. Uh, maybe there's other ways to do monetary policy, and maybe there's other ways to um, allow for the equivalence of, of cash and, and other ways to have traceable and know your customer. Um, type uh, outcomes um, that are very different with this technology, but we like to raise the question not only of um, you know, refining and iteratively improving law with technology, but also the big moonshot questions, which I think are raised by you know could the could the U.S. Mint issue um, you know the, a type of Bitcoin? It's a deceptively simple question, but it raises the big questions of you know fundamentally um, you know the role of law uh, in a self-governing society. It's worth answering, not necessarily choosing it, but um, like coming up with two or three potential systems um, by which that, that role could occur, and imagining the levels of um, economic and political and um, business and legal debate and deliberation that would have to occur to arrive at um, suitable solutions, I think is an extremely good way to evaluate that technology. And then to look at what it could really be used for in the maximally productive, um, you know, potential future like use cases. So it's a very creative question. I almost feel like having asked it, 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 it must be, um, it has to be hacked now. Like somebody has to prototype that and uh, kick the tires and imagine how it would look. Well, Daza, one, one thing I do think you have to think about with, with that, with the government issuing a coin is um, social equality and accessibility. Because the whole concept of a coin, you have, to, you have to have an electronic device in order to use that. And not everybody has an electronic device. So it would be um, potentially you could have discriminatory issues because there would be certain people who didn't have access to the coin because they don't have access to a phone or they don't have access to, to a computer on which to use the coin, which is one of the issues that, say, a sweet green and other companies who don't accept cash that they're dealing with because they're being told, no, you have to accept cash because some people can't shop at your store because they can't pay. So we can look at all of our public accommodation and so forth. Yeah, so it raises all the big questions. Good question, Brian. Um, all right, so um, may, may, um, let, let me get back to the panel uh, so that you can um, wrap it up. And then um, and then we're going to take a little break before um, Michael Casey. Exactly how you'd love to wrap. But. I think that was a pretty good way to end it. I think thinking about, you know, I was thinking about the, the idea of a, of a state court, thinking about a government issue cryptocurrency with the issues that Susan raised, which is then doesn't the government know where every dollar in Bitcoin you have is and where it's spent or to whom it's transferred? So you start from, if you think you start from the crypto anarchists, with Camera two. All the way to the government. This is not what they have. Settled norms about what you do with your money, where you keep it. Yes, you're supposed to tell the IRS how much you made and pay them, but the rest of a lot of your transactions, many of them, maybe you don't necessarily, you know, expect the government to be monitoring. On the other hand, everybody uses credit cards everywhere they go, and there is already a record of it. Think about what we're talking about. When's the right time to legislate? If you look at that span from Bitcoin to the hypothetical Fedcoin, the change in the impact of those technologies, any time along the line that you tried to regulate, it wouldn't adequately capture or address the concerns or opportunities raised you know, on that same spectrum. So that's, I guess that's where it takes me. Yeah, I, 
I'm, I'm right there. I mean, I think technically you could certainly do it. You can have digital gold that already exists today. Asset you could create. It's more a question of should you, not could you. Right? You can't put the genie back in the bottle. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much the lesson from this stuff. Be careful what you let loose. Okay, so thank you everybody for doing that. Uh, thank you, Shauna, for joining us uh, remotely. Thank you all for coming um, all the way to Boston uh, to help educate and also to um, challenge us uh, to, you know, in, in view of a better um, understanding of the legal frameworks. What could we build? Um, what could we? What problems could we solve? What challenges could we potentially achieve? Our student projects. So. Um, lots of good inputs, and uh, will everyone please join me in thanking the panel. Everybody out there in television land, um, we're going to just go dark um, for uh, a few minutes, and then we'll be joined by Michael Casey, and um, he'll throw up down the gaunt the gauntlet also for uh, the microgrid challenge. So thanks again, Shauna. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye, Daza. Bye.
We're going live in about in a couple of minutes. Stand by. Oh, oh, hey, David, could I, I know you're, this is a lawyer paid right No, but I was asking, could you shut the door, please? Um, all right, um, so we're back um, for uh, extra innings of the computate, the first computational law course, which is off to such a rollicking good success that people, it's like that great cocktail party. Right, where people want to keep talking. That's <laughs> what I reckon is success. No one is too drunk on computational law. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's a it's quite a brew. It's quite a brew. Yeah, yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, I have to drink some. Oh, good for you. Yeah, I wish I could join you, but I gotta I gotta get out of here. So, um, I I'd like to say, um, and this is saying a lot because I love MIT. It is my extreme. Uh, I'm very grateful to introduce my favorite person at MIT. Now, Michael Casey. Now, I just um, say this particular minute. Yeah. 
That's right. <laughs> um, nowadays. Nowadays. Um, um, and, you know, in the day of forever it's worth credit where it was due was Bill Mitchell, who was my mentor and brought me into MIT. God rest his soul. Okay. But um, I'll tell you what, though, um, what you are really like, you, you landed at MIT and you're just going all the way, you're taking it full on, and you've got projects and you're doing cool stuff of the type that I like because it has a hacking quality to it and it's innovating in the realm of business. It's got a strong legal element, but it's all, it's really driven by the powerful potential of these new technologies. So um, I'm thrilled to have you here. Thanks for dropping by. Okay. And I was just wanted to ask if you could share a bit about your, I'm sorry, on the phone we have um, our main speaker from tomorrow, who's um, Chris Berent, a partner at Drinker Biddle. Um, introduced to me, by the way, by uh, Jason Barron, our first speaker. They're partners at the same firm. And I just wanted to thank you for um, joining us by phone so you could get a taste of what Michael was saying and maybe we could enter some of it into your uh, computational contracts lecture tomorrow. So thank you, Chris. My pleasure. And if I draft, I apologize for trading Okay, on the phone. So could you, could you bring us up to speed a little bit about sure. the microgrid project? And then yeah. if you want, I invite you to chuck the gauntlet down and pose a challenge. I know that sure. there's some legal dimensions to what you're trying to solve. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, serendipitous that I was able to be here and do this because uh, I do think this, this is an interesting question for you guys to explore. And, it's, uh, and I'm hoping that I can get some value out of it as well. So basically what I'm doing is um, Exploring the prospect with a group of students from Sloan, also from uh, ECS, also from here at the Media Lab. Uh, the prospect of, of building a distributed transactive microgrid, um, a you know, off-grid part of Puerto Rico at the moment, right? So everybody knows that the, the public utility has been sort of decimated. Actually, it was almost decimated before the hurricane came along because it was bankrupt. Um, and then, uh, you know, at least technically bankrupt. And then the, uh, the hurricane came through and, and just has wiped out you know, so much of the infrastructure. So you have these communities around the country who've been out without power for ages for energy, but they also had this very strong emerging uh, belief or at least desire to pursue a new power. And, and there are many of us who believe that the future of energy is, is a distributed structure, decentralized structure. And there's many arguments for that. One of the strongest, though, is was made clear by the hurricane, and that is that you get more resiliency, arguably, if you've got multiple nodes of generation, so that if we just knock out one of them, as we did during the, the, uh, the hurricane and the sort of major transmission lines that they had, then everybody goes down, right? Whereas if you've got... So multiple locations, you lose one, at least you've got another. This is a sort of an architectural <coughs> design feature of many versions of security now. We're thinking about the same thing with data security, cyber security. So we push control of data out to the edges. Maybe there's less of a honeypot for hackers to enter into. And, and so now we have, um, you know, a very different way of thinking about security. You know, to spread it around distributors. So that's one part of it. But we also think that if we can move... Uh, generation capacity and most importantly pricing power away from these centralized institutions and bring it down to small market groups then the learning and the data sharing and the information that comes from the community can be that much more powerful and that maybe there are better decisions that get made around both the generation and use of power particularly in an IOT coming environment where devices can be programmed to turn on or off depending on what the price is or what other signals they're getting. So right now in a centralized model, typically it's a sort of a take or pay model where the central utility is just setting the price, right? Well, that's that's based on a price that's, that's bearing within it all the costs of credit, all the costs of, you know, the centralized architecture, the infrastructure, I would say corruption. I mean, these are all sort of components of what come to the pricing model that you are forced to both pay and to receive if you are generating your own power and selling it back to the grid or if you are just receiving it from that. But if we have this, again, this model where multiple nodes can share and the price is now being set by whatever the local market is, you know, interesting things could emerge out of that. People could decide that, hey, I'm just going to, I think that the, there's, there's clearly a, a rising opportunity here because the price of power is growing. There seems to be greater demand for Wi-Fi services. So, 
I'm going to add more capacity and put up a cell tower and build my own, you know, mesh net or something, or I'm going to uh, put an irrigation system in. And so there's a pump that I need to do, and so I can add more power for that. Or, or maybe it's getting too expensive, so I'm going to, you know, figure out how to bring in a more efficient you know, uh, air conditioning system. You know, these these decisions we think become more fluid. That's the kind of economic thinking. So we try to think of it not as um, <coughs> Macro grid, but rather an economic development platform that communities now can do this. And so, what we're doing is we've we've found an institution um, that is uh, uh, it's called INE Instituto Nueva Escuela, and they have forty five different charter schools around the country, around Puerto Rico. Each of them in underprivileged areas. Um, Interestingly, and I'll get to why this matters in a little while, they have a public charter. So they're working, they're running public schools, and that gives them some interesting opportunities in terms of public finance. Um, and we're, we're, we're basically sending students down there on a site selection mission to look at each of these places to find what we think might be the ideal community to experiment with this. The school would be the anchor institution. A school will typically have some unique qualities. It has a, a fairly large, you know, comparative to a home at least, uh, demand requirement, consumption, but only during certain hours of the day. So for solar energy, that's interesting. There are hours afterwards and obviously on weekends in which it's, it's potentially drawing in a lot of capacity. So we think that with uh, battery storage and, and others, we can use that as a sort of a base load kind of model, but then we'd hook it up to a, a load variant community you need to think of these things quite a lot in solar obviously because you get variants through the days and everything else you know a factory perhaps that is producing things would be one of them there's this, this, the schools themselves actually have a number of their own sort of factory relationships for school supplies a uh a retail outlet of some sort maybe a restaurant a couple of houses that are both generators and a couple of houses that are just purely consuming. And so through this relatively small community, we create you know, the makings of a mini economy and you know, supply each of them with uh, generation capacity, the school being the biggest, but the others having different loads. And then the blockchain becomes important because what we're trying to do is to create a decentralized marketplace. So there's no central utility in the middle setting the price, running the ledger, this is something that, that's already being experimented on and used in Brooklyn, for example. There's this transactive grid there by a company called LO3 Energy. There's a company called Power Ledger in Australia that's doing these sorts of things. Um, so, you know, it may be that the blockchain actually doesn't isn't necessary. Maybe we, we would just create some sort of uh, a central entity. The school itself might just run the thing. We don't know. But this is nonetheless part of the experiment is to figure out what's needed to make this thing work efficiently. Um, and, uh, but, 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 you know, there's all these sort of big questions that we face in doing this. Um, one of them is, and these are, these are things that I think, you know, it'd be interesting to have legal minds put, put themselves to, um, you know, I don't want this entity to have to go through the sort of bureaucratic red tape of, of the, a regular utility would. It, you know, will it be designated as a utility? How does it define itself? What is the, the corporate structure of this group? Is it a cooperative that actually runs the whole thing? Who owns it? How does that structure work? What is it? How does it relate back again to whether it's a utility and whether it should be regulated by a utility? Is it a virtual utility? Is it a real utility? Um, you know, we, we want as light a burden as possible, obviously, for, for regulatory purposes. Um, and, and, and the thing is, we are trying to define a different paradigm here. We really want this not to be uh, a centralized model. And will the regulations force us to build a model that, 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 that undermines what we're trying to do, right? So this is one problem that, that I think is, is interesting to explore. In addition to the simple idea about how do we structure the contractual relationships here? What are we, we typically the idea is that you would generate a certain amount of electricity and that would be represented as a token and you can sell those tokens uh, to others who then buy the right to to draw down that that electricity whether it's stored in battery form or it's a right to be delivered in the future so the trading can be sort of separated sometimes from the from the actual uh, energy um, product but you need some proof that what's being 
uh, claimed is is backed by real generated electricity. Um, so there's sort of a contractual question in all of that. I think um, you know design around where the rights and obligations are, who owns the capacity to generate this, what sort of an asset is that. And then in the midst of this, we're thinking about how we're going to finance it. Um, and the there's two core questions I think are, are interesting here. Um, one is, do we have uh, rights to FEMA money? So, Typically, obviously, because of the hurricane, there is a right that uh, people in Puerto Rico have institutions to, you know, disaster relief funds from FEMA to rebuild the infrastructure. Um, but there is, we don't quite know what the ruling is on this, but if, if you're not building back exactly what you destroyed, or at least some re representation of it, if you're building something that's quite different, does that exempt you from from the right to have that, that, that food. In other words, is it reconstruction? Right. Of is it reconstruction of an existing like construction? Is it new? Is it an investment or is it reconstruction? Uh, it would seem, you know, very unfair to be forced to build something, you know, old, inefficient, clunky, and broken uh, for the sake of, of just bringing in uh, FEMA support. But on the other hand, we're also very interested. We want this to be a private sector model. The whole idea behind this is to um, allow to empower communities so that they can scale it and that there is the capacity to draw down financing on their own terms and add in a very organic, quick, fluid, easy way capacity when it's needed. And this is where uh, blockchain technology can become quite exciting because we think through smart contracts, uh, digital uh, payments, smart devices and the like, we can construct smart contracts that, that defer certain rights to the investors that they can execute without having to necessarily go through a central jurisdiction because there's the sort of the executability of those rights via the, the, the contract written into the computation. Um, and this is an idea that we've been exploring in different ways, but what's come up that I'm quite excited about is that uh, just a few days ago, I was out in San Francisco and I met a guy called Jace Miller, who's actually an MIT alum. He's from uh, DUSP. He, was, he, went, he was an alum of DUSP, the, the Department of uh, Urban Studies and Planning. And um, he has this wonderful company called Neighborly that is disrupting public finance. And what they're doing is, is using a crowdfunding model uh, and sort of smart um, you know, computer modeling to disintermediate the investment banks that have dominated and and essentially sort of centralized and um, depersonalized, in fact, uh, a municipal bond market that was traditionally something that people bought into personally, right? So he, he turned up with these wonderful old bonds with all the embossment, embossed images from the past that people have kept over the years and there was this personal connection that people had in their towns to investing in the waterworks or whatever, right? And that's all gone because it's now all massively handled through, you know, Wall Street machines and with that comes all the excessive underwriting costs and everything that, that we know is broken with that, that system. These guys are saying, let's get back to the, the roots and link this guy to that guy, but they're doing it in a modern way with, with technology, so crowdfunding. And now they're thinking of the blockchain. They're thinking about ways you could tokenize uh, the bond, share that. And then there's this idea of smart contracts, which then can sort of allow you to uh, you know, construct, as I said, this bypassing of the system. And why that's really sexy when it comes to Puerto Rico is that right now, if you are buying a Puerto Rico, or more importantly, if you are selling a Puerto Rican bond, you are incredibly hindered by the sort of bad brand name association that comes with that, right? So you're paying this high premium for, for, for subjecting uh, the risk of your bond to the collection capacities of a Puerto Rican institution. We would argue that if this school, which as I said is a publicly chartered school and therefore has the right to issue municipal bonds, um, could do so within this community. Maybe it would issue bonds on to, to, to just simply pay for its portion of the grid. Maybe it would issue to cover the whole cost and then sublend to the, to the smaller players in that group. I'm not quite sure of that yet. But either way, if it could do this and have 
a smart contract direct relationship with this pool of social impact investors that Navely has access to a couple of billion dollars worth of, of funds waiting to invest in this sort of thing, um, then you could make a pretty strong case, and these guys have got that kind of community to have these conversations with, that you can separate almost entirely that out that Puerto Rican risk and it goes away because you're not investing in Puerto Rico per se. It's input, it happens to be in Puerto Rico, but it's got nothing to do with the political risk of the place. It's to do with the functioning of this grid itself and the, your, how well the, the software itself functions in terms of your ability to, to make that claim. So we think this is pretty exciting because we can now, in addition, this is, this is a core part of the way we're thinking about this grid is it's not just an experiment in electricity or electricity trading, it's a platform upon which we build other ideas. And this is a, another idea, a public finance component, which then hopefully becomes something that can be scaled. So that we'll, we'll probably come in and subsidize the cost of this thing, but we don't want to, this is also to this point about FEMA, we don't want this to be entirely free for these people because we need them to have some risk capital, right? We're not gonna be able to study the economic dynamics and reality of this place unless people who, are involved in it have some skin in the game that's the nature of economics right so we're not quite sure what the balance is we don't think they have to own this thing at cost but you know maybe there's a bit of fema money in there there's a bit of uh the the the, the, the actual contractor but then there's a bond that they have to pay back and it's a it's a muni bond or something like that and uh you know, within that structure, we've got something hopefully that, that, that makes this far cheaper than the ridiculous 25 cents a kilowatt hour that they play in, in, in those parts of the world. Um, but also is, uh, is a model upon which to, to build the future. And that's pretty much it. So you have a question, yeah. I do, so I'm trying to get my brain around what the is describing. And absent the blockchain concept, it sounds very, it sounds very similar what they already have out there, like the rural uh, co-ops. Yeah. So is, is there any difference or would it be a very similar to the rural co-op? And if we can already establish those here, then why, why is it a challenge to do there other than you're talking about the blockchain aspect of it? Are it, you talking about the initial funding of it? No, I don't think it, it, it might not be. In fact, rural co-op, we've thought about this. We've talked about this as potentially being the structure. Um, I mean, I would think the difference tends to be could could be in the ownership structure. I don't I don't know. Like um, we Is haven't. Um, I, to be honest, I don't know enough about them exactly to sort of be able to give you the legal definition. But I think that you know the the general idea is uh, in a lot of these regions of the United States where you have you might have a better explanation for it. My understanding is that there are places that uh, inherently are. Um, in hard to, they, they, they could be off grid, they're not, but they, they are in difficult, costly places to transmit from the central power. So the, 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 the sort of cheapest way for these uh, communities to come together was to form a co-op co -op in which there was, it's a non-profit that um, essentially gets them to share power <coughs> based on, they would probably collectively own uh, one or two generation plants. So I think the, the structure of it legally could be similar, but I think the physical structure would be different because we're sort of talking about an environment where people can like add, you know, panels on their own roofs, whereas a co-op would sort of collectively own one single standalone generation plant, right? That would be my understanding. Maybe Chris has got a better answer. Yeah, this is Chris. Um, in Puerto Rico, I don't recall many cooperative or co-op municipality structures in place prep up tends to have um, presence just about everywhere except behind the meter microgrids and so on. What you described though, um, just as a point of electricity law here, in the vast majority of jurisdictions, it is not the production of power for self-consumption um, uh, uh, that triggers you into utility status. It is the distribution of an electron or a thermal scheme from one enemy to another that tends to trigger utility status. And that, that uh, and I use utility status broadly, that's everything from using a, you know, a certificate of public good and public convenience to having to go through full board, get an office service rate filing, um, and have you know, full board rate regulation. 
uh, on what we charge our customers. Um, I've encountered this issue quite a bit um, here in the mainland of regions, and um, my team developed a, a, a self distribution structure that we uh, just finished rolling out um, in a deal that um, closed recently where we um, represented the master developer of the parts of all three medical care. Uh, campus and putting in a microgrid. And we used a microgrid concession within the structure with an outlook developer, uh, which was also fairly novel. But the key thing to keep us out of utility regulation, and I suspect this is also true in Puerto Rico, I haven't looked at the, the way the statutes worded it. But um, what we did is we made it so that all of the wires, um, steam pipes, and so on within the microgrid that are used various customers within the microgrid were collectively owned and held by the owners association um, for that mixed use campus development. And when you have collective owner of distribution infrastructure, you don't have one entity distributing to another, which is binary dynamic in most statutes. Instead, you have one entity distributing to itself. Um, and that um, has a bit of um, um, a rebound actually opens up the ability to self distribute in a continuous microgrid um, to multiple customers um, in a way that um, wouldn't have been possible um, in a prior or more triggered utility regulation. And we do that through uh, 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 infrastructure leases, uh, dynamics on having title to equipment added to the microgrid, and we that's for the owners association. Uh, and so on, but it's a uh, model and structure is a self distribution one. Um, and for what you're discussing, um, I think from at least a regulatory dynamic, uh, that could help. I, uh, I still have a lot of questions as the financing, all paper credit, getting the project financed, uh, and so on. And, um, but uh, at least on the regulatory side, um, uh, you should definitely take a look to see if the self distribution might work. Okay, that's, that's really helpful, Chris. I just have one. Question to throw back at you though, and that is, like, does that though uh, impede our ability to create a transactive environment where you've got, you know, each of these owners effectively trading with each other, so that they you know, you, you want to, well, we're trying to create some sort of competitive market forces within this environment. So underneath that, you know, collective ownership, I'd somehow want to have. Sub ownership or something with it that, that, that's, that's that's allowing them to trade back and forth, and on top of that, we'd likely have outside customers so that the grid is so not everybody who's an owner is also uh, actually sort of has put capital in. They're just so sorry, not everyone who's using the power has just put has put capital in. There are outside homes that are consumer only, whereas there are others that are prosumers. Um, yeah. How do, how do I can I can I square that circle? Yeah, you, you, you can, but it, it begins to get difficult. But this is where having a centralized entity, um, uh, at least uh, uh, taking the wholesale power purchases, uh, is difficult. Um, anytime you make a sale for retail, um, uh, or you're making a sale uh, uh, to someone on a wholesale level, we can trigger um, requirements to have um, wholesale special.
instead of sending the energy back to the main power grid where it's net metered yeah. on your meter against your retail rates, um, you would think it would be net metering, I guess, to be able to prosumers who had demand at that time within the yeah. prosumer you know, transactive energy network, yeah. which is a new market layer that's opening up um, with the dawn of um, more of the seven and last distributed generation. Yeah, that, that, I get that's, that makes sense. That's really helpful, Chris. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm very glad to hear that you didn't entirely put the kibosh on it. For a while, I thought it wasn't going to make it, but it sounds like with a bit of a... Good. Uh, and so, um, and, and we have all the documentation available on the website, and we have all the documentation that's fairly complex deal. Yeah. Uh, after, if you want to show them that PDF I sent you yesterday on the deal structure, you're welcome to. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate this, Chris. Thank you. I, I don't have much time, okay. folks, but I, I'm happy to take one or two yeah. good questions if there are any more. Oh, to me like yeah. What what is this? So first of all, good good catch um, on the um, rural co-ops. Um, any other ideas, yeah, David? Um, how how much would broadband be um, broadband access be part of what would be needed for uh, the? These are things we need to discover because this is a totally new model. It might be that you could create the trading system around a mesh network that doesn't necessarily need to be permanently online because it's just capturing that. And then you could, you know, periodically prove it to a blockchain on, on that basis, which is another architectural thing that we'd have to look into. Um, and so to be a deal breaker uh, because it is a problem, right? At the moment, all that stuff has gone down as well. But I think that. Um, you know, we, we, we certainly think that there's ways around it. On the other hand, what's also interesting is that we'd want to see, again, this platform to be the sort of place to actually experiment with the development of, of like community broadband, right? There's this interesting ideas. This could be the, the, the platform where you would sort of build that, that infrastructure. So I'm hoping we don't need it, but that we actually kind of make it something we get to build. Um, so high level question. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, we are going to be together um, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chris will be with us, and we'll have opportunity to use all this whiteboard um, to do some some creative um, mm -hmm. uh, lawyering and yeah. technical business architecting to find you know those yeah. that, that to make sure that legal is not an obstacle. Maybe even somebody's going to enable the best outcomes on the market um, yeah. and look at computational contracts. And then on Friday, uh, excuse me, on Thursday. Uh, with Brian and his team, and some, mm -hmm. uh, and some MIT undergrads will have a chance to maybe do some rapid prototyping. <clears throat> and then looking forward on uh, March 16th, 17th, and 18th is the Computational Law and Blockchain Festival. Um, oh, oh, only a fifth of us. We didn't write last night. <laughs> 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 but it's festival. Um, right. Technically. And, oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 Still, it does sound very fascinating. So it's going to be a computational law blockchain festival. We're going to have, you know, aspects yes. we'll have learning, but we're also going to have traditional hacking right. for people that want to do projects. <clears throat> what in these opportunities, and there'll doubtless be more, you know, with Sandy Pendleton's group and with law yeah. MIT, legal hackers. What what sort of things would be useful outside of you know, you'll obviously want to you'll want to have you know access to great um, high quality kind of um you know um counsel like like this. Chris yeah. was providing, but is there something to be useful as you're iteratively, um, you know, kind of almost rapid prototyping this from a legal perspective that um, that we should be on by way of challenges or um, team projects? Like, is something that would be useful or helpful that, that, that maybe has been holding you back, or the uh, that if you could do it, it would unleash, um, you know, some of the genius of the system. <laughs> It's funny because I have, we haven't gone far enough down the path yet that I've run up against what I knew would be the legal, you know, obstacle that I would bring minds like yours to bear to help me with. Um, so I haven't put enough thought into what they are, but I've mentioned some of them, right? I mean, how do we define the contracts of the, between these parties? Um, you know, what is the, the, the utility status question from a regulatory point of view? Um, you know, and then and what? how would the smart contract be? You know, so, so there's different... The smart contract in terms of the finance part, right? So I think there's this there's this concept that uh, you can create smart property, you know, sort of collateral that that is not necessarily something that is physically taken by somebody, but is defined as such because you have the capacity to remotely turn or off or on access to it, right? You've got a device that on off switch that can only be turned on or off if, if the right payments are being made. So digital money becomes programmable money, 
and that that gives you this this power to potentially execute uh, your rights. Is that legally enforceable? I mean, you know, how what how would you structure that, right? Um, and yeah, these are some of the things that people are already doing, right, with with cars that have on-off switches and so forth. And there's a there's a, a bit of a, a prototype for it with um, M Copa. You can look that one up if you like. M Copa was a, is a um, Kenyan-based company that's using the uh, monetary infrastructure of M Pesa, which you may know is the digital money payment system over the uh, airtime payments over the cellular networks within mm -hmm. Kenya. And the idea there is, is it's not what we're looking at, which is more of a, a kind of a rights to a bond that would eventually convert to ownership. But this is rather, um, and it's this is just one on one. And so people put buy a little kit from MCOPA. It's two panels and a few cell phones or something like that. And then, so long as they're paying, it stays on. When they stop, it goes off, and they, it's conceived of as um, pay-as-you-go access, right? But it's literally just being turned on or off by this thing. And then at some point, if you once you've paid out over a certain period of time, the asset transfers to you. So it's kind of like a, a lease-to-own model. Um, and we've thought that that might be something that you could sort of morph in a hybrid way into a security of some sort across a microgrid where different parties were paying up to a point, and different owners might be ahead or behind or arrears in the arrears and you know out of that would emerge some sort of structure that's a collateralized bond top of that. sort of pie in the sky but there's interesting things you can start to do when you when money is programmable when smart devices are tied to a blockchain that everybody trusts to execute on your behalf by joe i think you you pose the challenge okay um, so we should find we better get uh, we have to write that down um, and then see if we can fill it out a little bit. Maybe we can add it to one of the challenges for the uh, um, computational on blockchain festival. We'll have a we'll have a bunch of teams here at the Media Lab that weekend. But leading up to that, that would be a very interesting and not just for um, the energy thing to do, but I think quite generalizable um, asset ownership, you know, and access and management um, use case. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of primitive, what I call primitive or fundamental right. law in there in terms of um, let's call them. Um, um, building block um, rights of ownership that can be composed and you know partly um, transferred. Yeah. The big one, not just termination, you know, destruction of the property, but suspension of the service. Suspension of service. Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of a tweak from common law property. Now. I'll bet you that could be modeled. Did I hear the dulcet tones of Chris? Are you going to help bring us bring us uh, bring us home? Um, I was just going to say that while we're talking, thinking about the uh, you know ownership model and title, um, to remind everybody to think of title to something as a bundle of sticks, um, and that the uh, sticks include things like the right to maintain custody, the right to alienate the property, and then get rid of it, stuff it. Um, you know, the right to operate, um, to maintain the so on. And so, um, you know, you can contract any number of those rights. Um, um, out. Uh, and so it's just something worth you know, keeping in mind. Um, uh, uh, what Michael's laying out is not something you have to immediately uh, um, be running at. You can walk before you go and deal with some of the sticks in the moment. Sure. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's always helpful to be reminded um, uh, ownership is a bundle of sticks right, and a bundle of sticks in this case but i'm glad that you've been really grateful that Thank you, you. Took the time to think no, about it. Really and then to pose so, you know some of these sticks are more equal than others and a possible business legal and technical model mm. and a major one would be um addition to alienation and you know, leasing some other stuff the one that turns the service off in the utility context to keep that kind of pay as you go could be a very very potent um you know a point of concordance between the, the business legal and technical um, layers of the system, and that might be one that we want to separately model and do some smart contracts and blockchain um, prototyping on. See how far we get. Good idea. So everybody, a little help me thank Michael for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks. I have to run. I'm going to get a flight. So, uh, thanks very much for your time. Good luck with everything. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of this. We'll, we'll see you at your next time. See you later.
circumambulation. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. And, uh, and Chris, you're, you're welcome to, to stick on. We're just going to close, uh, close up class for the day. All right. So um, there's a very important thing that we have not done. Um, and that is just a quick round of introductions. Um, so um, may I ask, Brian, are you keeping track of um, how many um, active folks we have online? I know I saw Al, I saw... We had a total of 19. Could, could you put a call out to see if there's anybody that wants to do an introduction and it would be Telegram? Yeah. Would be the way we would do it, please? Thanks. And um, I just want to do a quick round um, in the room. Um, and um, should we... Um, do you mind if we kind of, if, as a group, that we save um, um, or DLA uh, for for last, and that you kind of go as a group? Um, so let's start. Hmm, why don't we start um, with you, if you may? Yeah, I'm uh, Michael Manak. I'm here at Northeast Town at a lot of companies. We need some machine vision, machine learning, and cancer security. And um, I'm also very interested in. Uh, blockchain technology and how we can use it in the health space and also just <coughs> also interested and also looking at legal space and applying more uh, machine learning to uh, legal space. So that's why I'm here. And actually, I don't want, yep. so I don't want to yep. have people go too long, but could you just highlight that part about um, AI and contracts and before and after a little bit, because that would be interesting. It might spark collaborators. Right, yeah, so the idea is to um, use natural language processing to read contracts um, for one particular product and then another product would actually be to use uh, machine learning to actually uh, look at contracts before and after lawyers look at to actually teach a machine what the lawyers are looking at and how you're getting more value out of having had the contract read by the lawyer. How do those, how do those say two entities, two lawyers on either side of the table come together and speak to each other? No, not to replace lawyers, but to augment. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say that. Uh -oh. Just like put your seatbelts on, lawyers. It's coming. Okay. Mr. Poppers. I am David Poppers. My favorite crypto person. I am. Uh, I'm at Mr. Greenwood at the Economic Space Agency um, in Oakland, California. That's true. And uh, I also moderate a trader, which is the largest live Ethereum chat on the internet, using Telegram. So I came here to help administer the Telegram group. And thank you. Yes. It's your birthday yesterday. Yes. Woo! Happy birthday. Yep. And so far, so good on Telegram, I feel, too, by yeah. the way. So, you know, like, do a real audit when we're done yeah. with the class. But, like, I haven't had one of those painful, I hate this moments on, on Slack, and I'm able to get a few things done quickly in our back channel yeah. too. So thank you, David. Um, who are you? Uh, my name is uh, David. I'm a software engineer uh, and uh, an activist uh, in Cambridge. I ran for city council last election, and I'm a member of SOBA. And uh, I'm quite sort of been a dive, done a, a deep dive into uh, the crypto technology over the last uh, three years, and I'm interested in uh, figuring out uh, how it can change the way that we organize and manage ourselves as communities. And I think that's uh, a lot of the discussion that's been going on is all the, all the models are always good to discuss if we want to come down to the primitives, as uh, described by, uh, by Desa. You're here, and this is one of the people that can help us to actually do some hacking, do some development. Um, hopefully, um, and I don't know, Angela, you're, you're in our midst. Um, welcome. Hi, my name is Angela Van Beckerson, and I'm a special correspondent with uh, GB Media Studios. We are following and writing a large um, primer on blockchain right now. We just are wrapping up in the AI. Um, and if you would get the chance to read um, our founder's blog, gregorypacific.com. Um, he goes pretty deeply into all of these subjects, and we did some interviews today. We hope to see some of you guys on another panel. Good luck, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for bringing the crew up today. Uh, our pleasure. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we have a we have a strong Portuguese um, segment uh, today. Um, Luciana. Yeah, Luciana Davis, Luciana, and I've been working. 
currently in two different projects on blockchain. One is for smart cities, so I'll be interested to talk a little bit more. The other one is a kind of a magic token that has been uh, leveraging idle blockchains that are not so congested like the main ones, and we can kind of support transactions to go in a kind of smart path. So mm -hmm. those are exciting topics. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Great. I'm going to do a quick run over here, and you can really introduce yourself. To me? Yeah, Mr. Okay. Legal Hacker. All right, my name is Brian Wilson. I, uh, I'm i one of the TAs for the course. I found and managed, founded, co-founded and co-managed uh, Kansas City Legal Hackers. Um, I work at a machine learning startup called Risk Genius where we use uh, advanced computer science to better understand the disparities of policy language and uh, quantitatively like find gaps in policies and uh, areas within the marketplace, within different marketplaces that uh, maybe are divergent. Uh, I also have a project with the ABA Center for Innovation as a fellow there where we're using, um, where we're setting up a data-driven legal framework to better understand and improve the efficiency of a wrongful conviction investigation so that we can create data about what the most common features are for a wrongful conviction and then use that to uh, create policy recommendations and uh, get people out of jail. So. Right. Innocent people. Innocent people. <laughs> Model legal hacker. Uh, yes. Every lawyers be like Brian. <laughs> yep. <laughs> You're here. Great. And I sort of introduce yourself. Yeah. I didn't didn't get a chance to tell you what I'm here for. So I'm basically interested in Sorry? Name again. Oh, Camila, sorry. <laughs> nice to meet you all again. So my base, uh, my basic interest here is as a problem to solve because transactions, they're not transparent the way they should be. Uh, and a good challenge would be using